Welcome to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me to discuss the 2021 film Zack Snyder's Justice League is Voices from Krypton author and returning guest Ed Gross. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Can't wait for this one. This should be fun. Here we are at the conclusion of our Snyderverse trilogy event. I won't lie, it's a little bittersweet. I've been rewatching these movies. We've been having these in-depth conversations, and I'm at this point now where I don't know the next time that I'll spend this much time talking about any of these movies. So it's been a ton of fun, but but also a little bittersweet. But I'm happy to have you here for our big finale. Well, thank you. A lot to unpack, as there always is for all of these episodes, and especially when we're talking about these Snyder films. But Ed, let me toss it to you first and just ask for your big picture take on on the Snyderverse trilogy, Man of Steel, BVS, the Snyder Cut of Justice League, just generally speaking, we'll get into all of the specifics, but generally what has your experience, what has your journey been with these films? Because we've seen they can be very polarizing. I've had my own journey with them, especially with the first two, started in one place, had a, had a long journey to get to the other end of that. And I'm just curious what your experience has been. You know, I went into it, uh, first of all, I'm a massive fan of Watchmen. Uh, Zack Snyder's Watchmen. It's just a movie that resonated with me. So the fact that he was doing this was very exciting for me. Um, My my journey with it has been Man of Steel came out and I really loved it. I had problems with the the destruction porn at the end. Uh, There were a few moments here and there, but overall, I appreciated what he was trying to do in the sense of introducing Superman as a real world being as opposed to a comic book character. Um, Batman v Superman, my biggest issue with that has been, uh, at least initially was I felt Superman was as angsty as Batman and it was making me crazy because it was like, we don't need two of those, uh, going around. And the movie itself was very disjointed until the ultimate edition came out. The ultimate edition came out and I fell in love with the movie. Uh, I still don't like the angstiness, but the point is it works so well as a movie. Now, we're not talking about Joss Whedon's version of Justice League, right? Right. So we'll ignore that, thankfully. Um, I get to the Snyder Cut, and it was it surpassed anything I would imagine it being, basically. And even in doing a rewatch of it and thinking about the other two movies and listening to your two previous episodes as well, it was like this revelation, not a revelation, I mean, it doesn't sound like a revelation, but for me it was, of the maturity that these three movies have brought to the comic book genre where it didn't feel like the typical, okay, we're doing an origin at the end. We have to have the ridiculously, um, it's going to sound ridiculous saying this in to what I just said about man of steel, but these sort of tacked on big battles between the heroes and the villains, you know, or uh, these felt organic to the movie, the things that happened in these movies. So I've come away now with a great appreciation for the three movies what snyder was trying to do making peace with the things that i felt weren't quite jiving with what i want from superman uh but leaving it very satisfied and and the ready for the next stage of superman on film whatever that's going to be with james gunn but very pleased in that we have these three movies that are unlike pretty much any other superhero movies out there So that's my take. Beautifully said. I love the way you encapsulated all of that. And I I agree wholeheartedly. These films were going for something different. And while they didn't work for everybody, I'm glad that we have them. And I've been saying this forever and time may very well prove me wrong, but I do genuinely think that these films will age well. And I genuinely think that as future generations and viewers come to these movies, I like to think they will be better received than they were when they first came out over this past decade. I really do believe that. So the fact that we even have Zack Snyder's Justice League to watch in and of itself is somewhat of a minor miracle. I think we had a confluence of events that led to this, certainly the fan movement, COVID, this fledgling streaming service then known as HBO Max that was looking for content. And all of this came together and we had this movie come out on streaming on HBO Max in March, 2021. So as I've been asking each guest, when, when we dive into each of these movies, what was your viewing experience and initial reaction when, when this happened? Like, did you watch it 
immediately? Did you wait a little bit? Did you watch it in one shot? Did you break it up? Just what was the viewing for like for you? It, it was immediate because, you know, first of all, anything that has Superman in it, I, you know, I, I don't want to wait. I want to see what it is and what they've done and that sort of thing. Uh, no, my, my son and I, uh, my youngest son, who's 30, uh, he and I sat down and watched the four hour version in one sitting, basically. Uh, I let my wife know. He let his wife know. We're going to uh, be occupied this afternoon watching this movie. And we did. And we were just like blown away. Couldn't understand how things were cut that were cut. Uh, whatever. I mean, that's jumping ahead. But yes, yeah, so we watched it immediately. And both of us were pretty blown away by it initially. So when we saw it. That's awesome. And I'm glad that you could share that with your son. I look forward to the day when mine is old enough. And if he has the interest (laughs) to sit down and watch it, as I have discussed on the show now multiple times, I was there at 3 a.m. ready for this thing. (laughs) I was ready for this thing to drop. I took a little nap leading up to it. And I just, I could not have been more excited and my expectations could not have been higher, which typically is the worst recipe. And that's the one thing, if nothing else, that I, I can never deny this movie. And I will forever be grateful to this movie for that experience because I sat there from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. and couldn't believe what I was seeing and how awesome it was and how different it was than that other version that we had seen in theaters. And it's so, again, it's so rare to have expectations that high and to have them not only not only matched, but exceeded. And I've now watched the movie, including the viewing for this episode, four times. Mm-hmm. I watched it pretty shortly thereafter that first viewing with, with my wife. She joined me for viewing number two. And then a little while after that, I watched the black and white Justice's Gray edition. But that now is going back a good a good couple of years. So it had been a while before I sat down to watch it for this. But man, I will I will never forget that feeling of of watching that movie. I actually rewatched the little video that I posted on Facebook after that first viewing and I was just basking in the glow of it. On the note of that other version, the theatrical version, aka Justice League, to be honest, I'm at the point I don't really need to say much, if anything, about it. The one thing I will say. And the best thing I will say, and certainly if there's anything you want to bring in about it as we're talking, please feel free. I don't want to step on your toes. But for me, the best and only thing I need to say is that I'm at the point now watching the Snyder Cut. I finally got to the point where this version of the movie has totally washed the taste of that other other version completely out of my mouth. Like I was watching this and I think for the first time I wasn't really thinking about, oh, this was how they did it in the other version or like this is what they changed. I was just in this and I'm very, I'm very grateful for that. No, absolutely. And and I still bounce a little bit back to that one, but it's mostly in, you know, sort of being the writing about it because, you know, I watch Wonder Woman and we'll talk about it when we get to it, you know, swinging the sword down towards the end of the movie, you know, hitting Stephen Wolf with it in the, in the Snyder cut and breaking an ax in the, in the uh, Justice League version. And there's so much of that kind of thing where it just it that felt more like a typical superhero comic book movie. And so comparing the two, it's like this one came out. And it was like, wow. I mean, all you do is get mad, first of all, at the executives who made this change in the first place. But uh, well, I'm sure again we'll talk about that stuff. But yeah, so it's uh, you yeah, know, Justice Justice League every now and then. If I watch it at all, it's more like to say, all right, it's another, you know, it's a little bit different stuff with Henry Cavill as Superman. So maybe I'll watch it for that reason. But that would be about the only reason. Sure. It it is some additional Superman footage that's out there in fairness. But as I said, when we did our ranking episode, I'm I'm good. Never looking at that. (laughs) Never looking at that. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I've been thinking a lot about certainly about this trilogy of movies and the reactions to them my own experience with them, and also the reasons why I'm doing these episodes. And I've addressed that already when we talked about Man of Steel, so I don't want to belabor that point. But I, I just kept coming back to to this. There was something that I couldn't put my finger on about why I felt the need to really do these episodes and to dive into these movies again and, and with the depth that we have. And finally, as I was getting ready for this recording, I was like, okay, I think this is what it is. The thing that I think I've had the hardest time reconciling, and I still can't really, to be perfectly honest, is 
I completely understand the individual issues that various folks have had with any and all of these movies. Things that we've mm. talked about in these episodes, Clark letting Pa die in the tornado, the destruction porn in Metropolis, the killing of Zod, uh, the the tone of Batman v Superman, uh, Batman killing, all like all of that stuff that people have cited. And even in this movie, the, the runtime, the slow-mo, like I get why someone might have an issue with any of these things that we've talked about. And look, coming up on 150 episodes of this podcast, I don't think there's been, there haven't been many things we've talked about where we've just loved it from top to bottom and said it's perfect, right? right? All of us as fans, we read things, we watch things. There are things we like, there are things we don't. I've made documentary films that have been reviewed and I've been subject subjected to that myself, as have you as an author, right? It's part yeah, of- Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. It's part of the process and, I, and that's totally fine. I think the thing that's been- the toughest for me to kind of grapple with is that for a number of folks, and I'm including friends of mine, people I know, fellow Superman fans who have also immersed themselves in all this material over the years, that for some folks, either individual issues proved fatal to their enjoyment of the, of the movies or the indiv individual issues kind of piled up to the extent that it then became fatal to their enjoyment of the movie. And that's the thing that I guess I'm most surprised by because even for myself, as someone who really does enjoy these movies, there are still things that I would have liked to have seen done differently. And I actually have yeah. a couple of things here for Snyder Cut that might surprise some people. But but still, it's ne it wasn't anything that ever made me just turn my back on these movies. And I guess that's the thing that I was, I don't know, so just kind of so struck by and, and continue to wrestle with is just... Again, this idea that that these issues could prove so fatal to to the enjoyment of the movie beyond just oh I like some things and I and I didn't like others. It's just kind of interesting to me. Again, I guess how polarizing these prove to be. You know, to me, it's it's kind of like J.J. Uh, Abrams rebooting Star Trek in two thousand nine. Now I've written more about Star Trek than I've probably written about anything. Uh, that which is shocking to say, considering voices from Krypton. A uh, little plug. Um, but when that movie came out, people freaked out and I couldn't understand it. It's like people want things to be a certain way and they'd rather it not happen or continue if it's not the way they want it. Now you could look at Star Trek that way. You can look at, I mean, I'm a fan of the old soap opera, Dark Shadows, right? They made the movie. It's terrible. The Tim Burton movie is terrible, but it could have been something that re-energized it. Planet of the Apes is another thing. You know, you could sit there and say, oh, I love the classic movies. I do, too. They were my Star Wars growing up. So I get it. But people are very close-minded to change. And I try, you know, go back to my own cliche, right, of going where the cape goes. It's, it, it's, that's my feeling is I go, I want to give everything its own chance on its own terms. So that's, that's my feeling about these movies, too. It's like you have to look at it of what it is. Those three movies now as a trilogy. Um, that's how they have to be viewed, not as, well, it's not like Christopher Reeve or it's not like George Reeves or it's not like Dean Cain or whoever it is. Just accept it for what it is, whether you like it or not, just accept it for what it is. So I don't disagree. At the same time, I'm going to I'm going to speak up for the detractors for a moment because I've spoken to enough of them. I've heard from enough of them where, yes, I think there are instances where there's that happening, where this isn't lining up with a preconceived notion of the character. But I there mm. are there are folks who I know have not invalid criticisms about certain aspects of the movie. Again, it's just the thing that sure. I really can't wrap my head around is, is anything in these films, again, being, uh, you know, just so problematic that you can't enjoy the movie. And as someone who loves this character so much and, and it's like we're watching the same movie and just having such a fundamental different takeaway, like I said, I, and I don't have any answer, but I think that's, that's mm. one of the reasons why I was motivated to do this and to get into these the, the way we have. So I, I do want to say, and I've been posting this on social media, but I really appreciate everyone who's been engaging with these episodes. I've heard from a lot of folks more than, more than we typically do <laughs> with mm. regular episodes. And there have been instances where people have been in total alignment with what we've said in defense of these movies. Uh, there have been a few instances, and I really love this, where people have said that the episode or episodes motivated them to rewatch Man of Steel or BVS. Cool. And that's, I, I mean, that's a huge win. I'll, I'll take that. Not, not for any other reason than if you come away enjoying something more than you did before, that's great. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but probably the most common piece of feedback I've heard is, 
I, I don't agree. I still don't like these movies, but I enjoyed the conversation and I, I appreciated the back and forth. And again, that's wonderful. And the fact that people will spend the time listening to discussions of movies that they really don't like <laughs> and, and points that they don't agree with uh, means a lot. So I, I really do appreciate that. And I hope we get similar you know, kind of feedback with this one. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned voices from Krypton. So rather than saving this uh, for the end here, where where can folks go if they want to pick up your oral history of Superman, which features My just a plethora of, of of interviews? Two hundred and fifty interviews. Who's counting? Uh, it's available uh, at Amazon. It's available wherever books are sold. Basically, uh, there's a the Kindle edition. I know the hardcover is on sale right now. It's like twenty dollars, I think. So it's like a ten dollars cheaper than it usually is. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, so it's out there and I would love people to check it out. Cause if you're a Superman fan, no matter what version of Superman you're a fan of, it's all there. So, you know, I hope people enjoy it. It's, it's a tremendous read. I was honored to be one of those interviewees. And I thank you again for that. And I encourage everyone to pick it up. And I also, speaking of books, I want to give a shout out to one of our audience members, a buddy of mine, Darren Kirsch, who wrote the book, the Snyderverse saga. And right. that's available wherever you get books as well. And especially when it comes to a lot of the behind the scenes shuffling and the road to the Snyder Cut of Justice League, we've gotten at some of that and we've talked about it more in other episodes. But really for these episodes, I've really been trying to drill down on the movies themselves. And so when we talk about the fan movement and all the behind the scenes, there's a lot more. And Darren was really able to capture that beautifully in his book. So I do encourage yeah. anyone who's really particularly curious in that. Uh, to go check out the Snyderverse saga. So Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yes, uh, I guess, I've heard of it. I guess one question I have for you, and this is something that I think this is really the first opportunity that I've I've really had to do this, which is to consider Zack Snyder's Justice League as part of this trilogy as opposed to something in and of itself, because this is, I think, really the first time I've watched all three movies back to back to back over a couple of weeks. Mm. And so I guess my question for you is how cohesive does this feel as a trilogy of films? Of course, knowing that he had plans for Justice League 2 and 3 and that didn't come to fruition. But just looking at these films from Man of Steel to BVS, to the extent that you remember those first two films uh, and, and, and Justice League, do they feel like a, a complete, cohesive, satisfying trilogy? They do. I, I find that when we go from Man of Steel to Batman v Superman, they all have their strengths. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses and all. And, you know, when you get to Justice, the Snyder Cut of Justice League, uh, it does feel like the final chapter in a lot of ways. It does feel like it's paying off a lot of what we had seen. We're seeing the arc of Batman. If you look at Batman from Batman v Superman, where we first see him in Metropolis when the battle with Zod is going on and he's witnessing it from the outside. From that moment, <clears throat> excuse me, to where he is in this movie, where he has that Martha moment, whatever you say about it, at the end of Batman v Superman, snapped him out of his craziness, basically. And the death of Superman has fundamentally changed him. And I think we see that in this movie, is that he's changed, he's come to grips with it, he has the regrets of what he did, uh, in the last movie, and everybody, all those characters, you know, the, the point, I guess, and this is where I think it is the most cohesive, you know, the biggest criticism everybody had about the DC movies was that they were rushing to catch up to what Marvel did. And they were, and there's no question about that in, in the w direction they took. You get to this movie, though, however, where people say they didn't earn this, they did, because every one of those characters go through tremendous arcs over the course of this movie. And I think it pays off beautifully. Well said. That was one of the big picture takeaways that I had was how immersive and character driven the Snyder cut of Justice League was and how this movie did have a lot of ground to cover. Certainly we had spent a lot of time with Batfleck in the previous film and we had gotten a taste of Wonder Woman in BVS, and then certainly had the solo Wonder Woman movie where we got her whole backstory. But coming into this, this movie had to establish Barry and Victor and Arthur. And to your point, I think really allowed us to spend enough time with them where you got where they were coming from, what they were about, and the movie did give them a place to go over the course of the film. 
So I know I totally agree with that. I think for me, and I, you know, I, I, uh, it's so, it's so funny to me. I was thinking about this with man of steel and BVS, the, the two, the two most polarizing of the three films. I think that's fair to say, and particularly yeah. BVS. And, and I came into both of those episodes, uh, again, defending far more than, than I criticized now coming into the Snyder Cut of Justice League. And again, I surprised myself a little bit, and this might be surprising. There, there were a couple of things that I did have some issues with that I didn't necessarily have the first couple of times that I watched it. But mm. now watching it in the in the context of the trilogy, there, there were a couple of aspects where I said, hmm, I'm not quite sure about this. And one of them is, and I don't know if this is a criticism or not. I haven't decided yet. It, it might be a criticism or it might just be a question that has a very natural answer. But so much of those first two movies thematically was about this notion of Superman revealing himself to the world and how does the world react and just his very existence shifting paradigms of what people think about themselves and their place in the universe. All the talking heads in BVS about what, what, what this guy is about, what he stands for, what should he do. That real world aspect, that thread is, I would argue, totally dropped in in Zack Snyder's Justice League. It's it's a, you know, we're very much focusing, zeroing in out on our budding uh, Justice League characters. But in terms of the world mourning Superman, you know, we're, we're told a bit about that and we see the banner, right, in various places. But I don't know. I felt like that was a, a key aspect that that wasn't present here that made it feel a little less cohesive to me but then I argue against myself and I say, well, it might just be that that territory was explored and right. essentially concluded That's my feeling about it. by the time we get to the end of, of BVS. And maybe that would have just been kind of running it into the ground if we were still in that territory. How, how do you feel about that? Well, I do. I do feel like it was kind of dealt with. I mean, I think my, one of my biggest issues, and I guess with Snyder, they do blend together a little bit, but I think with the Snyder Cut is... There's this feeling, though, there is this feeling like Superman's gone and the sadness of Superman being gone and all this. That, I don't think, was totally earned because if you saw the world treated Superman and Batman v. Superman, and yeah, he sacrificed himself, but there's still... The the mourning and missing of him seems a little disproportionate given what we had seen in the last movie. But that being said, I'll be honest with you, I think the threat, now this global threat was enough to say, all right, we've explored that. We have bigger fish to fry. And it's time to sort of bring these characters together to deal with the fact that Darkseid is coming or, you know, it's Stephen Wolf and then, you know, being the sort of the leader for, lead in for, uh, for, for Darkseid. So I, I didn't have really have a problem with that because it was like, do I want to see more of the world debating whether or not these heroes are worth having? I mean, I wanted to see a, a battle that we gradually built to that wasn't a gratuitous battle. That's what I enjoyed about uh, this movie so much, I think. So I wasn't, no, I didn't miss that at all. So. That's fair. I think, I think this is ultimately the problem that I had. And I've said this from the start. My biggest critique of the Snyder cut is I, I wish there had been more Superman. I wish that it had oh, been yeah, built too. for more Superman. And the thing that I've always said, and I think we all recognize is look, this wasn't Superman and the Justice League. This was <laughs> Justice League. And so he had a very specific function to serve in this story. And primarily his function was to be absent and to be missed and to be this inspiration and the memory of him that, that motivates Bruce and helps bring the rest of the team together. And of course, his clutch return at the climax. Right. And going back to things that I'll forever be grateful for and I'll, I'll always remember, and I've cited this so many times at this point, but- that walk through the scout ship after oh he God. has returned, so after he's regained his memories and hearing the voices of his fathers, including the new dialogue that we hadn't heard before at the end. And of course, the now, I think, iconic moment where he shows up to save Victor and blocks Steppenwolf's axe, <laughs> says, not impressed, and freezes it with his super breath before kicking Steppenwolf and proceeding to just pummel him for, oh, for the entire the crap out of him. Oh for my the God. entire <laughs> action sequence. Those moments are in my in my top ten or whatever Superman moments forever. And so I I, I can never deny the movie that. But this is the thing that I think kind of kind of bugged me a little bit. And please bear with me here. Part of this is 
you know, and I might have mentioned once or twice that the death of Superman was very formative for me. I don't know. Oh, really? No, I didn't know that. (laughs) (laughs) As much as the death itself was so pivotal, as we've talked about, what came after really is, is where the heart and the substance was in the comics. And one of my absolute favorite aspects of the death and return of Superman came in Adventures of Superman 500, when Jonathan Kent, who has suffered a heart attack in the comics, encounters his son, Spirit, in the afterlife and encourages Clark to keep fighting. And when we get out the other end of Reign of the Superman, there's kind of an epilogue issue where Superman and Lois encounter the Phantom Stranger, and the Phantom Stranger kind of lays out how it was that Superman was able to return. And yes, his body had to be placed within the Kryptonian rejuvenation matrix, but his spirit needed to return as well. And so that encounter with Pa in the afterlife was absolutely essential to his return. It wasn't just the physical, it was also the spiritual. And this might sound odd for me to say, I am not a religious person. I've said this many times, but I really do gravitate towards this idea that it goes beyond his body needing to be revived, that there's something else at play. I think it makes it more interesting, but also it gives the character more to do, right? There's a choice to keep fighting. There's a choice to return. What we get here is his body physically revived through the combination of the mother box and the Genesis chamber in the Kryptonian scout ship. Awesome. It's a great sequence. Once Superman's alive again, though, his quote unquote arc in the movie is he's confused and then he's not. And then he shows up and, and he helps them fight. And I, maybe I'm being a little, a little bit flipped there, but I, I just, I would have loved if we could have gotten anything, however brief, but something akin to that Adventures of Superman 500 story where you see right. some sort of spiritual version of Clark making the active conscious choice, I have to go back. They need me to do this. And I I guess you get a version of that when he's reunited with Martha and Lois in the flesh out in the field. And he's like, they want to be back for a reason. I need to find out what that is. That that line is so important, I think. It absolutely is. And I don't want to deny that the movie, that moment, it's great. And it certainly ties back to the first film with Jonathan's whole speech about you were sent here for a reason. Even if it takes you the rest of your life, you owe it to yourself to find out what that reason is. So I, so I loved Clark using that language and calling to mind what, what his father had said to him all those years ago. So it's beautiful, but, and and again, I appreciate you bearing with me on this. I think the thing that kind of, I find myself wrestling with is that a, a a decent amount of Superman screen time in this film, which is relatively limited is reserved for that confused battle with the justice league. And yeah, as a fan, it's cool, and it's the, the the action is awesome, and visually, it's very striking. But had that real estate been reallocated to showing him again in the afterlife, conversing with Kevin Costner as Jonathan and or Russell Crowe as Jor-El, or some right. sort of representation of those figures, I, I think that just would have gone a long way towards putting more meat on the bone as far as Clark's arc. I guess ultimately, I felt like the movie underserved. Clark and left left a bit on the table that they didn't need to. Did you str- did you bu- bump into any of that yourself or, or not so much? Well, it wasn't so much the resurrection, like I said. I mean, my biggest problem is yes that he is so limited in his screen time on it. Now, granted, that moment you talked about is pretty amazing. And I have to say, I'm you know I'm the biggest supporter of the John Williams theme, and I'm hoping James Gunn's going to use it and all that. And yet today, rewatching. When Jonathan says, fly, son, fly, and Superman takes off, uh, the the Hans Zimmer theme just really grabbed me for probably the first time that it grabbed me as much as it did today. And it was just very emotional and very powerful. And yeah, there could have been more on, like you're talking about it, him coming back and how he came back and fought to come back and all that stuff. I don't know how you would do that realistically in a movie anyway like this that is so rooted in reality, I'm not sure how you could then like, well, let's go to the spirit world and do this now and have Clark fighting to come back. I don't know. I just don't know how you could do that. I don't know if those two things would go together in this kind of movie. Um, you know, but that line, you know, they brought me back for a reason. And, uh, you know, I've got a second chance and I'm not going to waste it or something he says. So to me, 
that for me is the huge jump in those couple of lines that Superman has made in his return to us, to the planet, you know, to life, uh, that puts away all the angst, puts away in just two sentences, he basically expresses that he's come to grips with all of the things that were holding him back, basically. So anyway, I'm not sure if that even answers what you were saying, but that's what that's what came to mind. So there you go. Oh, yeah. Comics celebrates and promotes everything that is wonderful about comics, toys, artwork and the joy they bring to people. Visit them in person at one of their three locations, Harrison, New York, a.k.a. my local comic shop, Skokie, Illinois or Muncie, Indiana. If you have kids and have been looking for a family friendly store, look no further. Join All Yeah for exciting events, including creator signings, how to's and more. Visit AllYeahComics.com and follow All Yeah on social media for more. Their name says exactly how they feel about it. Say it with me now. Aw, yeah. We reference the television series Smallville a lot around here, and there's one Smallville rewatch podcast that's always at the top of my queue. Always hold on to Smallville, hosted by our pal, Zach Moore. Zach and his guests bring tremendous insight, passion, and humor as they discuss each and every episode of the series that ushered in the renaissance of superhero TV. Listen to Always Hold On to Smallville wherever you get podcasts, and keep an eye out for the other shows under the Always Hold On to banner, including Arrow, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Superman and Lois, and Star Wars. Yeah, no, and look, to your point, again, what what, what I'm proposing and, and sort of calling to mind that, that 90s comic storyline, yeah, I, I don't know that the movie was built for this, but I, I guess there was something along those lines that I, I found myself longing for, especially upon right. this, this fourth watch of the movie, but... What little we get, I think, does does go a long way. Uh, I, you know, I think for both of us, we would always want more. And in fairness, this wasn't meant to be the end of the story. One of the things that it breaks my heart we didn't get to see, we didn't get to see Clark's return to life. I mean, yes, we see him in his Clark Kent garb at the very end and we get the shirt ripped. Right. But you don't see Clark back at the Daily Planet with Perry White. Uh, and going back to what I was saying before about the the real world sort of touchstone of all of this, you don't get to see the world's reaction to Superman's return. And the reason why I I wish we could have t- at least touched on this is that in BVS, you have all of these people who are looking to him as this God. Right. And, but then he dies. So in a way, it's like, well, he he was just a man, right? Who, who fought and died for us. But then he comes back to life and you have to wonder how people would react to that. And so I guess sure. I just feel like these movies had so conditioned us to be thinking about what the world reaction would be. And we just don't get that here. And and for all we know, maybe that would have been a part of, of the next movie or, or not. I mean, from what Snyder has revealed, I don't know that that was necessarily the angle that a future movie would have taken. But it, right. just, just given that whole r- religious angle that we had seen, particularly in BVS, it's, it's like you would you would imagine there would be religious groups or cults or whatnot that would, that would oh, spring absolutely. up in support of him. And so it just, like I said, I just keep coming back to the idea that th- there was something left on the table here, but also keeping in mind that I know this wasn't meant to be the end of the story. And there was so much ground to cover with the other characters. And I, yeah. I look, he had already had a solo movie. He had co-headlined BVS. So I understand why the focus was elsewhere. Uh, I think his arc really was what we had seen in the previous movies. And this was just sort of to, a little bit of a bridge to get him. To He's get back, him back and he is Superman. Yeah. I mean, he basically is Superman uh, at the end of this. So, you know, one thing I want to say, because I just don't know if I'm going to remember to say it or work it in later is what I found interesting in watching the Snyder cut today was that if things didn't go exactly the way they did in the sense of uh, Snyder stepping away, Warner brothers interfering, the justice league, all that stuff, we never would have seen a four hour version of justice league ever. We might have seen a two and a half hour version one, possibly. Uh, so I really wonder, so in a, in a sense, this was a perfect storm to give us this vision I don't think we otherwise would have gotten. And uh, and I just thought that was an interesting thought today when I had that. So No, I, I, no absolutely. Because, you know, you're totally right. It's like, had Snyder been able to stay on the movie, there's no way they would have released a four hour version of this. At, Probably not even a three hour. At, you know, that's the thing. At, yeah, at, yeah. I mean, now we, between the Batman and Avengers Endgame, we've seen some three hour superhero movies. But so at most, maybe it would have been three hours. But at that time, I, I really don't think it would have been. Maybe we would have then gotten the quote unquote ultimate edition of, of Justice League. I, I don't know. But I think your point is very well taken. I think there's a, a realm of possibility where 
you know, for, for any number of reasons, we never got to see something like this. And that kind of points to what one of the main criticisms seems to be about Zack Snyder's Justice League. And it's funny because I definitely feel like the critiques of, of Man of Steel and BVS were far more fervent. I feel like with Zack Snyder's Justice League, not that it's without its criticisms, but I think, I don't know what to chalk it up to. I feel like maybe by that film, people kind of were like, all right, this <laughs> this kind of is, is what it is. Also, I don't think that there's anything, audience, or Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's anything in the Snyder Cut that's nearly as controversial as the choices in the previous films that people had such an issue with, right? Because, I, I mean, I guess I, that's all to, all to say. My feeling is when I look at these movies, the first two, and especially BVS, but the first two feel far more polarizing. I don't necessarily get that same sense with the Snyder Cut. Not what, at all, yeah. actually. I, I think most people, I think, have looked at this with much greater appreciation than they did Man of Steel or Batman v Superman. Uh, I don't know how you would look at this film. Yeah, you could say, okay, do we need these people singing to Aquaman? No. Uh, do we need all the slow-mo? No. Um, but that being said, there's not a lot about this movie, though, that's gonna that should really piss anybody off. It's it's and not saying that it's you know uh boring or just just sort of thrown out there, so there's nothing to complain about. It wasn't made for everybody, but it plays beautifully, and I think. You, you know, it's funny. I interviewed uh, Zack Snyder for this. I'm um, doing another Superman book, an official one. And I had an hour with him to talk to him about these films. And we talked about Batman v Superman, the ultimate edition. And the way he described it to me is, you know, the studio interfered completely and made him cut that film down. And we got the theatrical version. When the DVD people said, hey, why don't we do an extended edition? He went to Warner Brothers. And the way he put it is Warner Brothers could care less whether they did it or not. It's like, all right, throw it out there, see if it makes a few bucks. And apparently it's made hundreds of millions of dollars, according to him, you know? But what I walked away with after that conversation and in watching the Snyder Cut, the, it's they should have just left him alone. He obviously, and this is the thing, this is a guy who came to these movies with a vision. You may not agree with his vision, but he had a vision, and it's something that we got to see it really played out in the Snyder Cut, and you look back and you kind of wonder if there wasn't interference with what we could have gotten all along and how people would have reacted to it and how the box office would have been and just let it go. I mean, by having Joss Whedon reshoot Justice League and, and do all that stuff, they're the ones who pushed the budget to $300 million. You know, it wasn't Snyder. I mean, I'm not sure how much he spent, but it's probably you know, 200 or whatever. But my point is the interference is so obvious and when you see the unvarnished, uh, you know, I mean, or, you know, the unvarnished versions of these things where you don't have that studio interference, it's the director's vision. It speaks for itself, both of them, Batman vs. Ultimate and, and uh, Snyder Cut. No, I mean, a, a hundred percent. Um, you know, that was one of the other things, watching this for the first time. And we had a good sense of what was going to be in the movie from what Snyder had revealed over the years. And then what we saw from photos and the trailers and the clips, there was a lot that was released in advance of it, but I was still watching this for that first time from 3 AM to 7 AM on March 21st. I still remember thinking to myself, especially when you got into all of the backstory about dark side and apocalypse and Steppenwolf's motivation and the way he had been banished and and oh, yeah. communing with Dasad, all this stuff. And I'm saying to myself, like, you guys cut this? <laughs> like, are you kidding like me? Like Barry's run through time at the end. It's like, how does this get cut? It's 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 truly baffling. Uh, but I, I do want to, this was one other sort of big picture thing that I wanted to say. I'm glad you mentioned, this, again, this whole idea of, of, of the vision where... I, I do think is that this is important. I'm sure I've said this, but if I haven't said it explicitly, I'll say it again, that there's a difference between a story choice genuinely not working versus not working for you, i.e. you disagree with it. And right. I feel like, and I'm not speaking for everybody. I know they're all, they're all different reactions to these movies, but I feel like in a lot of instances, maybe sometimes that gets conflated here a bit, right? Like these movies don't line up with how you see the characters for whatever reason, for whatever it is you're comparing it to or not compare, whatever it might be. And then that sort of leads to this impression of, oh, these movies don't work. They don't get the characters. 
whatever the case may be. Um, there were a couple of examples that I thought of. Uh, again, please bear with me for a second here. But uh, there's a run of, of action comics from the mid aughts uh, by uh, Chuck Austin, which is a name that I think a lot of comic book fans know. He was very prolific at that time. Uh, not not necessarily um, a, a beloved comic book writer, but he, he did a lot at that time. And he wrote right. a year's worth of action comics. And during that run, Superman came across as far quippier than you you might expect from the character. Have you ever read this run? Do you know what I'm talking no, about? No, no, I haven't. Seen it. Now, the run lived up to its title. It was very action-oriented, and the art was fantastic. But Superman, again, his voice sounded more akin to a Spider-Man than That's a Superman. That's what I was just thinking when you said that, yep. Lois became increasingly shrill. Lana was repositioned as really a homewrecker. It was not a good look for the characters. And there was nothing, it's been many years since I read it, but as best I remember it, there was nothing in that run of issues that really contextually would have accounted for this change. It just felt like the tone was wrong and the voices were off. So that to me is I kind of my default example in my head of an instance where, no, like this is missing the mark when it comes to the characters. And that's sure. different, right, than whether it's, again, putting them in, in this real-world context or making certain choices. Uh, so, I, again, I think that's, that's an important piece to keep in mind. The other thing, uh, very recently, I've been re-watching the first season, not re-watching, watching for the first time, and the last, the first season of the Superboy television series. Yeah. Well, the first season, you got to get beyond that first season, but yeah. And I know, I know the show has its fans. We're watching. I'm watching it for a reason. So stay tuned. Going back to this whole for a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. But I've been making my way through the first season of the Superboy television show from from 1988. And all due respect to the people who worked on it, but whoa, is it a, is it a slog to get through? And that's an instance where I think it actually gets the voices of the characters just fine. But from um, storytelling, a, a technical, a production standpoint, it's, what's a nice way of saying this? It's very limited in terms of the, the vision that it was able to achieve on, on, on screen. I think it's fair right. to say. Absolutely. So again, that's all to say that there are instances where I think the voice can be off like that comic book run. There are instances where just, again, technically speaking from a production standpoint, we just really can't bring this vision to life on screen. For my money, that's not what was at play in any of in any of these movies. You had a very sure hand with a clear vision and all of the tools uh, at at his disposal, right, to to bring these movies to life and making certain choices, presenting these characters in a certain context, um, with thought behind these choices, whether you agree with it or not. And again, that's not to say everyone has to like everything. Of course not. Um, and that's not to say there's nothing to critique or disagree with. I'm not saying that either. But Oh, sure. There's plenty, yeah. Uh, and we've talked about a number of these things, especially going back to Man of Steel. There are things that could have been done that I think would have alleviated some of the, the concerns and complaints that people had. But again, by and large, uh, I, I, I think it is important to just kind of understand and respect the choices that were made. And you might not like them, but it doesn't mean that they're quote unquote wrong or that they don't understand the characters. So, right. In case no, I hadn't absolutely. said that as explicitly as I wanted to, there we go. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> but uh, in, in any event, so that's kind of some of the, the the big picture aspects of this. You had messaged me before recording and you said, this was a few days ago, you said, are we just focusing on the Superman pieces or the whole thing? And <laughs> right. the, the whole, I mean, if we just focused on Superman, believe me, I'm going to be done sure, in 20 minutes. Uh, right? We'd still get, believe me, we'd still <laughs> yeah. get a good, uh, we'd still get easily an hour and a half out of, out of all of this. But I mean, let me toss it to you. Yeah. What are the aspects of this film in terms of character, in terms of theme, in terms of wherever you want to take it that really resonated with you the most or that were most surprising to you? Like what strikes you most about this movie? I think it's the building of the team. It's, you know, I, I said earlier, it was the origins of the characters because each one got their own arc. Uh, you know, I think the thing that stuck hit me the most was by the end of the film, this is a movie about people reconciling their pasts and reaching a point where they're all ready to move forward. Victor with his father, Arthur with uh, Atlantis, and of course, you know, that would be explored more in the Aquaman movie, but certainly coming to grips by the end of the movie with what his role is and taking steps towards that. Diana dealing with, you know, referencing Steve Trevor and, and the loss that she had. 
And like, you know, someone I knew would love to have flown this. And it carries so much weight to it because we know what she went through with that. But she's also embraced life again, uh, you know, helping people and going out there, like that bank robbery scene, for instance. I mean, she's out there doing her thing. Um, Barry, I mean, Barry, you know, with whatever you want to say about the Flash movie, you know, Ezra Miller did such a good job with Barry's awkwardness, with his innocence, that by the end of the movie, he has found his place in the world, basically. And then there's Batman, you know, or Bruce, has has totally come to grips with where he was at, as I was saying early in Batman v Superman, to where he is now. And he is truly a hero. I mean, he is... He's moved away from branding villains and all that that mindset of Batman to being truly a hero. Of we have to do this no matter what it takes to save the world, basically. And then there's Clark. He comes back, and by the time, again, the moments we talked about before, you know, they brought me back for a reason. I've got a second chance. Whatever it is, Clark has now come to grips with his role as Superman uh, for Earth. These are the things that today really struck me, was that these characters all came to that place of reconciliation with their their own pasts and finding a family in each other that, you know what I mean? It's that had there been a movie after this, and even if it wasn't like sort of the direction Zach was going to take it, these characters would have come together and been ready to move on to the next stage, having found their personal peace. So. The thing that I keep coming back to, building right off of that, is grief and, and overcoming grief that seems mm-hmm. to be such a, a theme in this movie because exactly as you laid out all of these characters and lois as well and martha as well they've all lost right. someone very close to them and you see them working through that and then there's this whole kind of meta component where as we know Zack snyder's daughter uh you know very tragically passed away during this whole production and the movie's dedicated right. to her and so there's that kind of feeding into that as well but it's it's interesting because I would never really think of the Justice League as sort of this ragtag bunch of of underdogs, but I feel like that's almost the the vibe that you have here because of the the personal trauma that they're yeah. working their way through. But I think it serves the movie well, and like we've been saying, it it gives the characters a place to go. Bruce, I think, is a perfect example where one actually one of the few scenes we didn't talk about in the last episode that's a favorite of mine is when Bruce is talking to Alfred before he's before he's going to go confront Superman and he's, he's asking Alfred, you know how, you know, the Waynes made their fortune. Right? And he talks about how generations ago they were hunters. They were hunters, Alfred. Right. He's like this, this, i.e. killing Superman to protect humanity. Um, this might be the only thing I do that matters. This is my legacy. Right. So he's at that point in the movie and I, and I don't know that he really expects he's going to walk away from that, but he knows that he needs to do this for the world and to see the journey that he, he goes on. Uh, and what I liked too here, when we get to justice league, cause I was thinking about this a lot in terms of these arcs and for Bruce, right. It's not just that he's continually motivated by the loss of his, his parents and Robin. I mean, that's all there always, of course, but right. the fact that here it's failing Clark Failing Clark in life and the promise that he made on his grave that I, I, you know, I will, will, will honor you and I will bring this team together and I'll protect Earth. Uh, and the first opportunity that he has when, when there's even a hint of maybe bringing Clark back with the mother box, he is so single-minded in this quest to restore yeah. him, right? We are six, we are not five. Uh, and that exchange with Alfred about, you know, not, not waving the red cape, he's like, no, you do when it's this red cape, this red cape charges back. Uh, yeah. And he's... He becomes this man of faith uh, throughout the movie, which is not a color you would generally expect to see on Batman. But yeah, it's 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 a it's a great arc. No, I, I agree with you totally. And th- this goes back to again what I think one of the main criticisms has been. I, again, people harp on the slow mo. Here's the thing with the slow mo. I I don't know. Is it <laughs> is it that offensive to people? Not to me. It just I notice it once in a while. It goes kind of like okay, speed it up. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's one of those things, yes, I guess if it irks you and you're really kind of waiting for those instances, yes, it will It will grind your gears after a while. But one thing that I think even the even the harshest critics will give Snyder is that he, he has an eye for the composition of these shots. And so it's Absolutely. some really beautiful imagery. And so I don't know, if you can live in a moment for a few seconds more, is it 
Is that the worst thing in the world? I, I, so the, the no. slow-mo didn't bother me. And as far as the runtime, that runtime allowed us to have this time with the characters. And so Absolutely. I'll, I'll be grateful for it. I'll also say, I've, again, I've watched this now four times, each time in one sitting, and I've not had an issue with the runtime. I think those, there's, it's a very minor thing, but man, I think those chapter breaks are so critical. I feel like they go such a long way because that pops up and you're like, oh, we've covered so much ground and it, it makes right. it feel like it goes, right? Doesn't it make it feel like yeah, it's going faster? Yeah, it really does. It's like pops up chapter two. Oh, wow, we're already in the chapter two. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of the smartest things they did. I talked about this before, but when I watched it with my wife for her first viewing, you know, we, I sort of said, oh, you know, we can just, you know, we can watch half. We can stop whenever there are chapter breaks. And every time a chapter break came on, and look, she loves these characters too, but she's not as in this world as, as, as we are. But every right. time one of those chapter breaks came up, she's like, oh, well, let's keep watching. Right? Just, like, <laughs> right. You know, and I might have I might have fudged it a little bit as far as how many chapters there actually were. <laughs> the chapter two, Man. I was like, oh, it's almost just a couple more. <laughs> yeah, well, just a couple. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that goes a long way. But here's the thing, and hand in hand with the runtime, I think one of the things that's that's been said is that the movie is is overly self indulgent. And to that, I say, so what? You know, this guy got knocked around so much over the course of making these movies to the point where. While he was trying to finish Justice League in post-production, mourning this horrific family loss, he has the studio so far up his ass that at a certain point, right. he's like, I can't keep fighting you guys. I need to step away. And so they bring in the other guy to just butcher this, like butcher this movie. Yeah. So the fact that now he has the opportunity to do what he wants, you know what, man? I'm fine with that. I'm I'm totally fine. Again, the runtime works for me, so I don't have any issues with that. But for anyone who does, it's like, you know what? I think he, if there's ever a time to be <laughs> self-indulgent, this is it. And I think it, I think it, it, again, I think it earns it and it works because it allows you to spend the time with the characters. So, uh, but it's a guy with a vision. And this is what I was saying earlier. There is such a specific vision to this thing. Nothing is just thrown in there as extras. It's just like, oh, we're filling time here. You know, I look at this and say, all right, you may not always agree with his vision, but this is a guy who came in with a vision where how many of these movies, and it's so funny because I was, became such a Marvel convertee, and I, I mean, I, converte, I still am, uh, loving those movies, and I kept saying to people, oh, I love the Marvel movies, I hate the DC movies, they're just not nearly as good as the Marvel movies, and now I'm seeing this today, this was my revelation watching this, was that this has such a vision to it that a lot of these movies... And I'm not denigrating Marvel because I still love them, their movies. But a lot of the movies don't have a specific directorial vision that they are bringing to this. And this gets away from any sort of corporate interference or anything because it is literally his vision. He was allowed to do it. And there's got to be something said for that, that you may not agree with everything, but you can't say that he didn't come in here with something in mind and he got that on film. And that's pretty amazing achievement as far as I'm concerned. So. I agree wholeheartedly. Going back to the individual characters and their arcs, you mentioned Ezra Miller as the Flash. We have a few patron questions that I'm going to sprinkle in here. So this one is from our pal Brian Dempsey, who asks about the Flash. Do you think they actually knew the origin of Barry Allen, or they just had a character name and power set? Putting aside Ezra Miller's acting choices, that's the character they wrote, a smart Alec kid with speed powers. Do you want to, I'll toss that to you first. Do you have any, any response to I guess just generally this this universe's I mean, take on the character. Oh look, I didn't I didn't have a problem with it. I mean, I didn't sit there and go, that's not like the comic book. Now, admittedly, I'm not the flash uh, aficionado that a lot of people are, but I had zero problem with this. This I just looked at it as this is the take they're they're going with. And Ezra brings that quirkiness to it. I don't think you'd get him to play anything but quirky. Uh and it came together for me. I mean, you know, and again, you see his growth from this guy who says, oh, I'm in, I, I need friends, to a real hero by the end of this movie. And that's pretty astounding. So, no, I didn't have a problem with it. I'll say big picture with, you know, Victor, we don't we don't see again. But as far as, let me include Bruce in this, Bruce, Diana, Arthur, and Barry, What I one of the things I love about this movie is this is, you know, perhaps the last time we see them where they're not 
played for for laughs the way that they are later. They're not caricatures or, or self parodies. There, there's a, there's a, a groundedness to their presentation uh, right. here. Where this is the most that I ever liked Ezra Miller as the Flash. As we get into certainly the Flash movie, I feel very differently. But I feel like here they were able to walk, uh, you know, uh, the right line with this. To Brian's question, I don't know the answer. I. But to be honest, I chalk this up more to, and I'm sorry to all the Barry Allen fans out there, but I chalk this up to more, more to Barry Allen as a, as a character, as a comic book character, as an entity rather than, than to anything else. Like I don't, and I've said this many times over the years on various podcasts, it's hard for me to really articulate what Barry Allen's character is supposed to be. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem. And the most that we've been able to really kind of pin on on the character over the years does come from Jeff Johns and the this new this new revised origin when Barry Allen came back to life in the comics that Reverse Flash had murdered his mother as a child and changed the timeline and so now he's trying to figure out who murdered his mother and trying to free his father who's been in prison for the murder that he didn't commit and that's kind of, and that was a, the driving force on the Flash TV show and you see that here as well. Uh, you know, when you strip that away, it's, it's hard to say. He's just kind of like a solid Midwestern guy. I mean, so they could have kind of gone in that direction, but the fact that they wanted to imbue the character with, I, I, I guess a little bit more quirkiness or personality or whatever you want to call it. I don't begrudge them that now, whether this was always the take and then they found an actor who could do that versus they had this actor in mind and they crafted the character around him. I don't know. You know, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't right. know if that makes a difference or, or whatnot. But again, in my mind, I, I think it speaks more to, I don't want to say Barry's a blank slate, but I feel like there's, there's less, there's less to to kind of uh, cite as core identifying characteristics or personality traits of Barry Allen uh, that I think gave them more of a blank canvas and the hardcore of Barry fans, again, might disagree, but that's kind of what I land on that. Well, look, if if you're making a movie with, with Superman or Clark Kent or Batman and Bruce Wayne or Peter Parker and Spider-Man, you're going into that knowing very well who these people are, what they're like, and what you have, what expectations you have for each of them. When you're talking about The Flash, Hawkman, Aquaman, uh, you know, I don't think you go into it with that same knowledge whether you're a comic book fan or not you know who these other characters are you know peter parker gets bitten by a spider and he never shuts up during a fight and that's peter parker and you know clark is is you know the honor and and, and hope and, and all that and batman's the knight i mean you know these things and so i don't think anybody like if you change all that you're going to go in and say well, that's not superman that's not batman that's not spider-man but when you're talking these, it's like when Marvel did Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Nobody knew who Guardians of the Galaxy were. People barely knew who Iron Man was. And, you know, suddenly it becomes something because of the actor playing him in the movies featuring them. So I don't think Flash has that kind of baggage, good or bad, going with him. I think he's just a super speedster. And, uh, and now we can play with him as we see fit. I agree. And I also think that the this version particularly the age allows for the little bit of that generational divide yeah. there. Right. And so that opens up some different dynamics. I think my, out of the entire DCEU and when it comes to the flash, I think my, my favorite moment is that whole time travel moment uh, in, in the climax of the battle here yeah. where Barry has to go back. Uh, I, I love, I mean, when that, when that music kicks in, yeah. And so like, you got to go fast, faster than you ever gone before. And, and he's talking to his father. You were right, dad. I'm one of them. One of the best of the best. Make your own future, make your own past. It's all right now. And as he's running, you see the ground like reforming under his feet. Oh, yeah. Like it's, it's so cool. It's uh, just visually the music. I think all of it really came together. Like that's, that's definitely a moment. That's a highlight for me uh, in this film. And, and definitely oh. I would say my favorite flash moment of the DCEU. Absolutely. And, and you know, that was the fact that it's like, uh, going back to when my son and I watched this for the first time after Barry did that scene and you see Cyborg reform and Superman reform and, and the scene plays out. He just looked at me and goes, 
How did they cut this? It was obviously filmed. How is it not in the other version of this movie? And and it's true. It's like the, one of the most brilliant superhero moments I think ever captured on film. That ending. I just think uh, it's just amazing to me. So what what are some of those other moments that are just top of mind when you think of this movie? Oh boy. Um, I mean, look, a lot of the battle stuff is really good. Watching these guys going after Stefan Wolf and not being able to quite do it. You know, they're trying to hold their own and doing that and watching their struggles to do it before Superman shows up. Uh, that, of course, is the exhilarating moment. Superman, with the, what you said earlier, it's not impressed, you know, and, and all that. But then the the rejuvenation of them, that they now feel it and they're suddenly fighting as a team together. Uh, it, things like that, to me, were just thrilling to watch, you know? And, you know, the other stuff is just like, again, the character moment, Cyborg helping out the lady at the teller at the ATM, uh, changing this woman's life, basically, because he could. And he saw that she was in pain. And those are the things that really stuck out with me. So I don't know if there's anything like that ending sequence that stays with me the same way, but there are so many great moments in this movie and so many great character moments, which I did not expect going in. So those are the things that really stay with me. Acme Comics is a locally owned and operated comic book store in Greensboro, North Carolina for people of all ages and walks of life. With more than 40 years and a new second location to its name, Acme is a multiple-time Eisner Award nominee. The shop features a significant contemporary and vintage selection, as the Acme team uses their collective knowledge and resources to connect you with the best material. Mail order subscriptions to new releases are available, and all offerings are available anywhere via mail order. Follow Acme on social media and eBay, listen to the Acme cast on all podcast services, and visit acmecomics.com for much more. I'm a proud backer of the Paragons of Earth comic book project, now available to support on Kickstarter. The creative team of Percival Constantine, Thomas DJ, and Eric Johns have plucked forgotten Golden Age superheroes from the public domain, reinvented them as their own sort of Justice League, and put them up against a Lovecraftian apocalypse. Back this project and learn more by going to percivalconstantine.com slash paragons. Also, Perry, a multiple-time guest on Digging for Kryptonite, hosts the Superhero Cinephiles podcast, about comic book inspired films. Be sure to listen wherever you get podcasts. This episode made possible in part by educator, hobby comic book collector, and pop culture enthusiast Sam Lim. Sam is based in the South Jersey area and is looking to connect with other comics fans as well as retailers. They're also looking for comic shops to explore, so recommendations are welcome. Be sure to follow Sam on Instagram at SZL Comics to see their latest comic pickups and shop adventures. When Superman shows up, Beyond the not impressed, you're right. The way he galvanizes the rest of the team, it is thrilling, especially that moment where you have Aquaman and uh, Wonder Woman, and, and Arthur's yeah. like, "All right," and then, and then Diana, she's like, "Kalel," right? I, there, there's, there's something in that. I, I don't know what we want to call it. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be flipping. Say lust. But there's some, I don't know, man, like there's, there's some kind lust. of, not lust, but there's some kind of like, I don't know. I feel, I feel like she's feeling something in that moment. See, I thought it was more like almost starry eyed, like a regular person would get on seeing Superman, what their react, their eyes going wide, well, you know, like that wonder basically. And the fact that he inspired that to them, uh, that to me is pretty amazing that in that moment, He's inspiring both of them, and they're both like in awe of this guy. So I do, that's what I took away from that moment, anyway. I like that. No, that's no, I, that's a better read on it. And I, it's we talked so much last week about the the common person, uh, the way that they viewed Superman. We talked about that whole montage of saves, the Dia de los Muertos, the the folks right. uh, there with the flood, and the way that they would look at them. I love the way you put it that there's that similar type of reaction that he elicits even from his fellow pantheon like that's really that's really cool and what i love too is wonder woman's next moment when she steps back into battle that little smile it's like she's oh, that smiles ready great whenever she does it. and as far as other moments earlier far earlier in the movie and not unlike bvs there's not there's not no action until we get to the right. climax but there's not a, for a four-hour movie there's not a ton of those 
those yeah. action set pieces. It really is more about those character driven moments, which I very much appreciate. But when she rescues the hostages, the way that yeah. she moves in that scene, I feel like it was so effective in capturing how how her powers operate and just what she's capable of doing uh, right before she smites that terrorist. I mean, she just like oh, blows man. Him to she, he's dead, right? He's so dead. <laughs> For but all, you gotta say, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, no you, you go, go, you go. No, I was, I was jumping around to basically say, you look at all of these guys and you consider that Zack Snyder brought those people together. He cast those people. And my God, how perfect casting are these actors for these characters? It's really amazing. So I interrupted your thought for that, but that was, uh, that suddenly popped in. No, I agree with that. But also, yeah, I, uh, it's just, it's just funny for all of the debate about Superman killing Zod and Man of Steel, about Batman using lethal force and BVS. Maybe I just missed it. I don't know. People didn't seem to have that much to say about Wonder Woman in this movie. She doesn't have the same code, I don't think. I think that has something to do with it. If you think about it, yeah. Superman, even Batman, have certain codes that they don't, sort of lines they don't cross over. It's like in the comics, in that Justice League story, I'm sorry, I forget the name of it, where Maxwell Lord's got Superman's, you know, controlling yep. Superman's mind, and the only person who's going to stop it the way she knows she has to is Wonder Woman snapping Maxwell Lord's neck. Yep. She's the only one. She so she operates I think on a different level than they do. So she has no problem slamming her, you know, bracelets together and blowing this guy to pieces. Very yeah. true. Jumping ahead to the climax and the the final battle with Steppenwolf. I don't I don't want to invite debate where there doesn't seem to be to be much of a debate, but again, it's just interesting to me all of the discourse about Clark killing Zod in Man of Steel. He is he is exceptionally brutal towards Steppenwolf. I mean, he's just pummeling oh. him throughout that sequence, and then yeah. lasers off one of his ears. What are antlers? What are I we guess, horns, calling ears, horns? Whatever horns. It is, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, horns. And then when we get to the very end, that beheading. There are some assists there, right? First, we have, first we have Arthur. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> <Stab him. laughs> trident right through him. So first you get the trident. Then Clark comes up and just clobbers him, punches him towards Wonder Woman, and then we get the beheading before the ultimate stomping of the head by Darkseid. I, I, I mean, I guess, uh, do you have any feelings towards Clark in particular, uh, that violence towards Steppenwolf? I do. Um, you know, see, I'm one of those people like with, with Man of Steel, with the Zod killing of Zod thing. My feeling about it is even though people say, well, you shouldn't put him in that position. Well, that's not real. I mean, if you put somebody in a position, there's not always going to be an easy way out or a comic book way out. And when you've got a guy saying, you know, you uh, the only way this ends is if you if I die or you do, uh, you're really not left with a lot of room of what to do when a family is about to be shish kebab, you know. Uh, so uh, I get that. In this scene, yeah, I did enjoy not impressed. I didn't. And that look on his face when he sort of rises up and delivers a kick that sends Stefan Wolf flying back. I would like to think that Superman could have knocked him out with a punch rather than punch, punch, heat vision, punch, punch, burn off the horn. And just like, look, just standing over him and just like pausing for a few seconds and punching again, then pausing for a few seconds and punching again. That to me did seem excessive. I mean, I was into the moment, but in really looking at the character of Superman, even not going back to like saying, well, it's not the Christopher Reeve one. He doesn't have to be. But that kind of consistent dealing out force against this guy, like I said, I have to believe if you use the right punch, you could have knocked the guy out. And that would have been enough for, you know, even if Seth Wolf got up after that, at least it would have spared some of that ongoing violence basically against him. That's the thing. I'm fine with it for the, Almost the entire duration of that sequence. But I think when you get to the point where the villain is on the ground on his back and Clark is still just punching and like he's taking those breaks and <laughs> going yeah. at it again. And I don't want to belabor the point. We, we talked about this at length when we talked about the killing of Zod and that interview that Henry Cavill did about wanting to do another movie. And he's like, you know, we want to see where Clark goes. Of course, he wouldn't kill now. You watch this and it's like, no, nah, man, I think he would. And, and that that kind of speaks to my larger feeling towards all of this where I, I I do think the movies, particularly Man of Steel, could and should have been clearer about what Clark's takeaway was from the killing of Zod. And if the takeaway was, I hated doing that, but 
I had to do it. And if I'm ever in that situation again, I'll do it. I, I accept that. I know other fans would disagree, right. but it's like, no, that's fine. But I do think it's important to to kind of know where the character lands. Clearly, Henry Cavill may have some view of where the character landed. But, you know, you look at something right. like this and I don't know. And I, for, uh, maybe there are fans who have been who have been kind of uh, you know, discussing this online, but I, it, it, it certainly never seemed to reach the level of, of the discourse around Clark killing Zod. And I can't help but imagine here we're dealing with a. Uh, you know, primarily CGI, very alien looking character, even though Zod was well, an alien. caused but, a lot of destruction and killed a lot yeah. of people. And maybe that's part of Clark's reasoning. It's like, you know, you really put people through hell. Boom, you know. <laughs> Just, yeah. You know what? You need another one. Boom. <laughs> I yeah. don't. No, there's a, vi- there's definitely a visceral uh, thrill to all of this. But, but also too, you got to keep in mind, well, let's, let's headcanon. We'll say that Alfred really gave Clark a detailed, account of everything that's been going on because it's like clark's missed all of this so he comes yeah, in, you know? but maybe alfred really kind of teed this up and clark was just like all right i know everything i need to know this guy's going down but it was just it's just interesting to me especially given the end of man of steel and just kind of all that conversation around it to see such brutality uh at, at that point yeah you know you brought up alfred i just want to say real quick i love the moment where he's alfred refers to him as master kent and Clark just looks down with a smile. Like, yeah, Bruce told him. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just thought that was really good. Oh man, Jeremy uh, Irons, so good. I it's funny for all yeah. the for all the talk in our last episode, I don't think we mentioned him in particular and this depiction, mm-hmm. but it's I, I absolutely love it. And what's great here when Bruce brings everyone back uh, and introduces Alfred, and he's like, This is Alfred, I work for him. Uh, it's funny, <laughs> it's also a great payoff because in BVS, there's that moment where he makes the coffee for Alfred in the morning. Right. And it's, it's like, this is ostensibly right. your butler. <laughs> like, Here you go. That, that is uh, that is true. So Very that cool. Was great. Yeah. Superman and the battle, this calls to mind another question. The black suit. Yeah. Which, as we know, Cavill was wearing the blue and red while filming and then Snyder made it black in post-production, which was always his plan. I think he wanted it to be black from the start. Studio said no. He figured he would have room to maneuver uh, in post-production as he clearly did here. Did you like the visual representation of the black suit? Did you feel like there needed to be any kind of accounting of why he was wearing black? How did, how did you feel about all that? I mean, I thought the suit looked cool. And obviously from the comics, we've seen him from the death, you know, death and return of Superman. We saw him in that black outfit, basically. I didn't really have a problem with it because, you know, unfortunately I was bringing comic book stuff in rather than movie stuff and thinking, well, maybe that's helping absorb the sun faster. It, you know, it's a power suit. It's it's absorbing it faster. My biggest problem with the suit is when he opens his shirt at the end, it should have been the blue shirt, not the black shirt under under his Clark Kent guys. Uh, that was sort of my biggest issue with it. I had no problem with it all along. But at the very end, when he's back to being Superman, we should have had the red and the blue. I mean, that's, that's my feeling. But As so I have a couple of thoughts on this. So... <laughs> So overall, yeah, it was cool to see Black and certainly going back to the comics, like you said, there was, as a fan, there was something very cool about that. This was a different version of the Black suit in that there was yeah. the cape, right. which was a different dynamic, but I, I came around on that. I thought that was cool. Uh, a couple of things. One, it, we're talking about BVS, one of the things we talked about, and I think maybe this kind of points to that angstiness that you were referring to with BVS, where in that film, Superman doesn't articulate a lot. Clark does, right. Superman doesn't. But I've made my peace with that. I talked about it in that episode. I think I think that was a specific choice to really make you focus on his actions, what he's doing, as opposed to what he's right. saying about what he's doing. And like it or not, I, I think that was the reasoning, and I'm cool with that. In this movie... It is tough. This was one of the things I did struggle with a little bit. Clark says very little in this movie. I mean, he's not in most of the movie. Right. And then even when he's back, that whole first sequence battling the Justice League, not a word is said. Again, it was different in the in the theatrical cut, but here he doesn't say anything and only starts to speak when he goes back to the farm. And of course, I love I love the idea that that's the place that he would go, right? When right. everything else is stripped away and he's just down to the the core fundamental aspects of the character that's home for him the farm the farmer's son i love that and the the brief exchanges with lois and martha out in the field i think that that goes a long way i mean that's most of what he says in the entire movie is when they're out there in the field about i'll take that as a yes i've got a second chance i'm not going to waste it it's me ma uh (laughs) me ma (laughs) that's right me ma me ma um but again walking through the ship he's hearing 
you know, he's hearing the voices of his fathers and then he's taking his flight and we get the not impressed, but that's all he says, right? Isn't yeah, that all he right. says in, the, in that whole final battle and there's the brief exchange with Bruce. So, you know, he doesn't say a lot. And while I'm cool with that in BVS, because I think that was a specific choice here, I don't know. I, there, there are moments where I, I would have liked to have gotten more of a sense of what's, what's going on. I think we get enough, but mm-hmm. I still wanted more. Uh, of of what he's going through and get, not to belabor the point and go back to what I was saying before, but you know, if there had been a moment with Lois at the farm where, I don't know, he saw n- news clippings or newspapers about the world's reaction to his death and he had some kind of takeaway of like, oh, like they, they get it now or something like right. that. Yeah. I, there are little things that I, 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 I longed for and I, I would have liked to see. Anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying we're, we don't know. Like we can only speculate why he donned the black suit. Why, why, as he was walking through the ship, he picked that one. Right. Um, and, and so it's hard. It's really hard. Was it just that that was the vibe he was feeling at that moment? Was it that there was some sort of regenerative aspect to it that we're just not told, but that is part of Kryptonian science. And he flies up right. And he just stands there soaking up the sun. And then, and I, I that's in my mind, in my head canon that that's why he was doing it because it was, quickly feeding his solar cells. I mean, we can go with that. And then to the end though, I, that's, so this is the thing. I, I don't disagree with you. I think had that shirt rip been the red and blue, mm. I, I think that would have put been the cherry on top of this to kind of show like, okay, he's really come out the other end of this. Uh, and, and is, is that version of the character. This to me kind of calls to mind everything that we went through when we were talking about the Richard Donner cut of Superman two, mm. where, not to go too far afield, but you look at the at the Donner cut, and I'm a big fan of the Donner cut. There's a lot there that I, I really do love about the movie, but I think it, it it encounters some roadblocks because of Donner's refusal to use any Richard Lester footage that yes, he like absolutely, absolutely, absolutely did not have to use. And so it feels like this kind of incomplete thing where had he relented a little bit and made some of those concessions, I think it could and would have been the superior version. You might still feel like it is. I, I go back and forth, but I, I, kinda, no, I don't think it is, mm. but I kind of have that in mind here where I think at this point when the Snyder cut was coming out, there was at least an idea, a hope, some kind of inkling that maybe he would be able to continue with subsequent movies. I don't think it was like, this is all you're getting ever. I think there was still some kind of question mark about, well, we'll see how this does. And, and maybe there will be more. And I, I wonder if that, in part accounted for, you know, why he, why he kept the black at the end. Cause I think if you switch him back to the blue, I think that puts a little bit more, maybe a little bit more of a period on it. Whereas you keep him mm-hmm. in the black and it's like, oh, well you got to see what happens. Now. Like, I don't know if that's what was that play, but I was kind of wondering about that. But in the epilogue, he is in the blue and the red. There's that one shot where he lands and starts walking towards them. And he is in the blue and the red then after he's been mind possessed by uh, dark side. Well, that's the thing but, that's a very, mm-hmm. this is a very tough thing to reconcile because all of this business about the the nightmare future, yeah, we we get that new nightmare sequence that Snyder shot new for for the Snyder cut in 2020 or whatever. But we also have the vision that uh, Victor has earlier in the film when they're in the scout ship of of this right. future. And in that, you see, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's still in the black suit. He is cradling the corpse of Lois, yeah. right, with Dark Side behind him, putting the hand on the shoulder. That's when he succumbs to anti life. So. I mean, if we're putting all of this together, it's like he's still in the black suit in the next movie. Lois dies. He succumbs to anti-life. And then from the nightmare sequence from BVS and the nightmare sequence from the end of the Snyder Cut, it's like after he succumbs to anti-life, then he goes back to the red and blue. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't, I, I don't like that, first of all. I mean, I'd, like I said, rather in the blue. But I, I have to be honest with you. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to this uh, or maybe this is it. But I wasn't interested in seeing dark Superman after getting the character back to where he probably should have been by the end of this movie and feeling like he had sort of become Superman to have him go dark in the next movie again. I just have zero interest in seeing that. Uh, even with Snyder's vision, I just don't think it's interesting to watch him make peace with who he is and then lose that and suddenly become this, this threat to earth. (sighs) We, we were going to get there and we're here and let's, let's talk about it. Okay. I, I agree. I, th- so this was actually one of our patron questions from our pal Perry from superhero cinephiles back when we started this run of episodes, w- you know, would, would we have wanted 
to see that five film arc as Snyder intended to see Justice League two and three as he had planned. And I, we've already, I think, laid this out enough. But but again, for folks, the idea was that in the next movie, Clark would entrust Lois's protection to Bruce and Darkseid would boom tube into the Batcave and kill Lois and Superman in his grief. And you see that glimpse uh, in, in, in Justice League where he's holding that uh, Lois's body uh, in his grief would succumb to the anti-life equation, become this agent of Darkseid uh, that would then give rise to that nightmare sequence that we've been seeing glimpses of in these films and ultimately would take Barry traveling back in time to reset everything. And then it would ultimately culminate in that fifth movie in Justice League 3 in uh, all of the armies of, of Man, of Themyscira, of Atlantis, of the Green Lantern Corps, all of, of, of these people coming together, just like we saw in the flashback to the first battle with Darkseid on Earth. Uh, and all these people would come together and be able to fight back Darkseid, and that would be our big triumphant conclusion. So I think that fifth movie would have been a win, <laughs> but that fourth <laughs> movie, uh, I, I'm with you. I think, I think I have two problems. One is just... Look, the evil Superman trope is one that we've seen a lot. Oh, so much. To yeah. the point where I think it has become a cliche. And I think we, you know, like you just rolled your eyes as I, I'm sure I did as I was saying it. It's like, I think that's kind of the gut reaction at this point after Injustice and, you know, Red Sun and like all that kind of stuff. So I, I, when you think about, regardless of how you feel about Clark killing Zod at the end of Man of Steel, when you just think about the reaction to that and the way people kind of saw the character. I think to to now invite the audience to to spend time with the character, even a character under the thrall of Darkseid acting in that way, I think it's a tough sell and I think it would feed into the you know some of the discontent that a lot of people had about these movies anyway. That's not necessarily a reason not to do it, but I I think it I think it would have been a really hard sell to be to be honest as far as getting people on board with this number 1, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's also the issue of, and I probably have said this to you off mic in the past, that the more you present this image of Superman as the angry god, basically, and the more young people that grow up watching these movies, the more they re think that this is who the character is. It's kind of like when the new Star Trek shows have gotten away from the tenets of the original Star Trek shows. I'm not saying you have to be a slave to it, but you can't go from utopian future to one where everybody's corrupt and everything is dark and that sort of thing. So the more you get away from the tenets of these things, the worse it is because the new generation is going to embrace the newer versions thinking, well, Superman, of course he's angry. Of course he's fleshing his heat vision. Of course he's going to do kill Zod. Uh, that's where my big issue is that that it corrupts, and I sound like such a fanboy saying this because I don't really mean like I'm such a slave to things. I don't mind change, but it corrupts the vision of hope that Superman is supposed to represent. So I hear you, and I think that I think the deciding factor for me, and we just, as far as I know, we don't know the answer to this, but this for me is really critical, which is. What ultimately saves the day? Is it only Barry going back in time and getting this warning to Bruce or whomever else and changing things? Or in that nightmare future, is Clark able to break free of Darkseid's influence and maybe help Barry go back in time? Because for me, that is a critical difference. Yeah. If Clark's story in J Justice League 2 is only that he loses Lois in his grief, he succumbs to anti-life and it's only Barry's time travel that fixes everything. I'm not there for that. Right. If it's that he's able to break free and then help set things right through time travel, I'm more open to it. I think it still has all the problems that we've been laying out about presenting Superman in that way. But, but at least if he has some agency, if he has some arc, but if you're see, and that's the thing where I really, it's, it's a tough thing because there's a huge part of me that's like, yes, I wish Snyder had finished his vision. I wish we had gotten the next two movies. But right. I think this could have been a, a major stumbling block because we already had a movie here where, like I said, Clark's main function was to not be there. And then he shows up and, and there's action and it's great. But if then his function in the next movie is to just be this puppet of dark side for most of the film, I'm not cool with that. So no. there's a lot. So it's a big... It depends for me as far as what the angle would have been, but I don't know. Just from what we know, I, I'm 
more inclined to say no. I wouldn't have wanted to see that. No. And when Man of Steel came out, I, I, I was friend, I'm friendly with somebody who worked with Zach on the on the film behind the scenes. And I remember when I said, I'm really upset about this destruction thing. He doesn't feel like I've grown to like the movie more, much more now. I said, I'm really upset with the destruction thing and that this doesn't feel like Superman. This just feels weird and different. He goes, ah, but it's like a comic book arc. Zach has this five film arc. So by the, you stick around and by the time you get to the end of the fifth film, he will be Superman. And I just looked at him and said, do you really think the audience has the attention span or the tolerance to sit through five movies to get the character they want? Maybe two, but five movies? I don't think so. And to, so to me, that was like a non-starter. I mean, it was just like, this is a terrible idea trying to get him to be Superman by the end of five movies. And then it's over. <laughs> I mean, you know? Yeah, I, I also, how do I put this? Like, I, I have defended and will continue to defend the version of Superman that we got in these movies, in Man yeah. of Steel, in BVS. So I guess I, a part of me, too, kind of rejects this idea of like, oh, well, no, he needs to now become the Superman we know. Well, what is the right. super? You know, with smiling and waving. I mean, is that what we're talking about? Because no, like, I agree. You see his yeah. heroism throughout. So I think that's there, there's something to that that I kind of wrestle with. You know, if this were a, if this were an HBO, if the DCEU had been a, a you know an HBO Max series, and it's like, well, mm. by the end of episode ten, hour ten, right, we're gonna go. We'll, we'll get to this version of Superman that we want to present. That I think maybe you can sell an audience on, but not five movies over you know, however, you know, five to 10, 10 years, 15 it's like years, too many right. years, you know, it's just, it's too long. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a big question mark, but speaking of, of our, our listener, Perry, and, and just kind of some of these other big picture ideas, uh, when we talked about man of steel, we talked about that open pod that was on the scout ship that everyone assumed was Supergirl. Right? Everyone assumed was Supergirl. <laughs> and we, we mentioned right. that in the episode, uh, Perry reminded me of actually something that I, I had read about, but I had totally forgotten. That's, are you familiar with this? What Snyder's idea was? I'm not sure. Say it in. That the gods, like those Olympian gods, like Zeus and Ares, were actually ancient Kryptonians. And huh, that, I know, I like, that, that was the explanation for who came out of the, the ship. Whether I, I don't know if it was that the person who came out of that ship was, you know, uh, Zeus, for example, or, uh, you know, was, was an ancestor of Zeus or whatnot. But it was this idea of kind of merging the Olympian gods with ancient Kryptonians, that there was that connection and that lineage there, which sometimes, <laughs> sometimes constraint makes the artist and sometimes maybe not <laughs> as much as right. I'm all for vision and creative freedom. That's one yeah. instance where I'm like, you know, that might be, that might be a connection point that we don't really need a line that we don't need to draw. And what does that say about Diana then? Right. I mean, she's, a, I mean, seriously, it suddenly changes that. So it, nah. Uh, <laughs> so I say a big nah. <laughs> to uh, that idea. Brian, uh, Perry also brought up something else. Uh, this goes back to our BVS discussion. I don't want to harp on this. We spent a lot of time on the, on the Martha moment, but he brought up something mm. that I do feel begs a response, especially because I, I did, when we were done, I was like, oh, we didn't get it. For all that we talked about, there was kind of this one little pocket that we didn't talk about. We talked a lot about why it was so important that Bruce heard Martha, right? And how that was what got him out of that state that he was in that trigger and uh, right. enabled him to snap free. Perry's point was, well, it doesn't make sense. Why would Clark, why would Clark say Martha instead of save my mom? And to that, I guess I have um, a couple of responses. One is for all Clark knows, you know, Bruce was about to deliver the killing blow for all Clark knows. That's the last word he's going to be able to get out of his mouth. So saying the name of the person gets Bruce a little bit closer to, you know, to maybe finding her. Right. So I think right. there's a little bit of that. Like if this is all that I'm going to be able to say to this guy saying my mom isn't enough. So I think there's that. Yeah. I think also, and this was a line that we had, we had quoted, but we didn't make this connection point where earlier in that scene, when Bruce is dragging Clark, he says, I bet your parents told you, you were special that you yeah. were sent here for a reason. So Bruce understands biology. Like Bruce knows that Clark has some parents. I mean, yes, it's alien right. physiology, maybe not, but I, I think fundamentally, and that line kind of shows like Bruce knows that he has parents. Um, so 
whether or not Clark is really going through this entire calculus in that heat of the moment, I don't know. But I, I think it all kind of speaks to this idea that just saying my mom isn't enough. This guy knows you have parents, right? There needs right. to be something beyond that. A personal connection, basically. Try to make a person like this is a person, not just this ambiguous mom. Exactly. And then also, too, in that scene with Lex, Lex was like, Martha dies, Martha dies. So I think there was also the fact that Lex was talking about her in that way. Maybe that was part of what was in Clark's head, too. I don't know. Um, is there anything else you want to... I know I'm really putting you on the spot, and we're not here to talk about BVS, but is, there anything, that you, about any but is there anything else about that that you want to say? No, just... I mean, I have to be honest with you. I've been reading these comics since the 60s, and uh, I have to say... I never realized that their parents had the same name. It never occurred to me. So I don't necessarily agree with the reading of why you say that name so many times. It might have been a little over the top, that response. That being said, it's actually a very cool connection. And given that that's the thing that snaps Bruce out of that insane blood vision he has for killing Superman... I think it worked really well, and because that's an incredible coincidence that I've never heard it referenced before, that they both have a mom named Martha. I mean, that was great. So, no, I didn't really – initially, I had an issue with it by – it seemed a little over the top to me, the response. But in subsequent viewings, that's sort of realizing that that's sort of been the key to knock Bruce out of where he was at mentally or emotionally – uh, I, I think it, I think it worked really, really well. So, uh, no, I'm really, yeah, in no, retrospect, quite happy. I agree. And so that's why I think Clark says Martha and why he does. And so looking at it from either side, whether you're looking at it from Clark's perspective or Bruce's, I think it works uh, there. One, one last piece to that. I, and then I was second guessing myself, my read on that. I do not think that Clark realized that Bruce's mother had the same name as him. I don't no. think that's why he said it. He knows nothing to do with it. He knows Bruce is Batman. When he shows up for that battle, he's like, Bruce, please. Like, so he's X-rayed right. him. He knows, but I don't think he's gone so far as to look up his history. I mean, my God, when, when Clark first saw Bruce Wayne at that Luther benefit, he's like, who's that? <laughs> like, he has no idea. Yeah, well, I didn't get is. that, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a little much <laughs> to me. Who's well, that? especially, no, I agree. Especially because I don't know. You think about who Bruce Wayne would be equivalent exactly. to. Like, I don't know. It, Elon Musk or something. It's like, how would you right. not know who this is? And it's it's compounded by the fact that there are these like sister cities across the bay from each other. So it's yeah. not even like, oh, it's on the other side of the country. No, I can't like, buy come it. On. Yep. Um, don't buy it at all. That was one point where it's like, come on. Yeah. So I definitely don't think that, uh, you know, Clark was manipulating him in any way. I think that was why he mm -hmm. said it was he thought that might be the last thing he says. And he knows that my mom wouldn't necessarily register because Bruce yeah. already acknowledged he has parents. So anyway, I love you, Perry, but that's my response to that. Uh, another, <laughs> another. this is a fun, not that Perry's question wasn't fun, but there's another fun uh, patron question going back to our pal Brian. Uh, Brian says, <clears throat> speaking of the characters, which ones actually had their superhero name used on screen? Bonus points, if they're mentioned, how many don't have the in front of the name? Like in the caption at the beginning of BVS, it says the Superman um, you know, the arrival of the Superman or whatever. Uh, he says, I recall Clark telling Bruce, the Batman is dead. And does Bruce refer to Arthur as the Aquaman? Uh, yes. But are Flash, Cyborg, or Wonder Woman referred to by these code names at any given time? If not, is that a missed opportunity? The All of the names, except, f well, I don't know. I'm not sure if Brian's asking strictly in this trilogy or in the entire DCEU. But um, yeah, I mean, at some point, all of these names are used. I think so, but... I would be hard pressed to honestly to say where they may have been used or not used. I know the Aquaman, uh, the Batman. Yeah. So uh, Superman. Yeah. So over these three movies, at least Superman and Batman are said by multiple characters. Uh, right. Barry refers, Barry says Wonder Woman when they are digging up Clark's grave. So that is. He said. does. They, I don't think anybody refers to him as the Flash, though. I, no. I don't think so. And you know why? Mm -hmm. Because when you get to the Arrowverse TV crossover and he meets Grant Gustin's Flash, and I think Barrett, like Grant Gustin's Flash says, like, oh, you're the Flash? He's like, oh, the Flash? Like, that's a cool name. So, yeah, I don't. we hadn't yeah, gotten that yet. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, Bruce refers to Arthur as the Aquaman. I don't right. know when they when in the DCEU we get Aquaman. And I, I don't know. It might not be until the very end of the 
second Aquaman movie where he's at the press conference and he's like, I'm Aquaman. And that's the end of the (laughs) the series. I could have said Iron Man, but I'm saying I'm Aquaman. Right. (laughs) Uh, And then they refer to Victor as the cyborg. Uh, I think at one point Diana says he's a cyborg. And then later on, I think Bruce says to Diana something to the effect of like, oh, did you find the cyborg? And she's like, his name is Victor. Uh, You know, so uh, the, the code names are all used at various points, but you know, here's the thing, and I'm, I'm glad Brian brought up this question because this is important, and I think this ties in with the underlying spirit of what we're saying here. I don't think about these characters in, in these movies as their code names, and I, I think that's a great yeah. strength of the movie. I think about them as Arthur and Victor and Barry and Bruce and Clark and Diana more right. than I do Aquaman and Cyborg, and that's because we yeah. really got to know these characters. So, no, they don't really beat you over the head with the code names, but- I, I'm I'm fine with that. Fat Moose Comics is New Jersey's best and oldest comic book store. Established in 1982 and under new ownership since 2020, Moose sells a wide selection of comics from every publisher and time period, along with action figures, graphic novels, posters, statues, and more. If you're looking for something and they don't have it, they can probably get it for you. They know a guy. Visit Fat Moose and Whippany the next time you're in the Garden State, and be sure to reach out via the Fat Moose Comics Facebook page. Hey, it's Bill Bodkin, editor-in-chief of thepopbreak.com. Join myself, Amanda Rivas, Al Manorino, and a cavalcade of awesome guests on the Socially Distanced Podcast, the flagship podcast of thepopbreak.com. And it's Amanda Rivas. If you're a pop culture obsessed nerd like we are, then you need to make Socially Distanced an integral part of your life. We talk all the things, Marvel, Star Wars, you know, everything on Disney Plus pretty much, as well as the hottest trending shows and news in the world of pop culture. This is definitely Al Manorino and not Bill Bodkin. So listen to the Socially Distanced podcast every Friday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so we can eventually get Disney Plus to give us advertising money. Please, we could use the money. I I have children. Filmmakers and movie fans alike should be sure to attend these film festivals. Brightside Tavern in Jersey City, Hang On to Your Shorts in Asbury Park, Point Lookout on Long Island, and Round Reel in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Take it from an alum of two of them. Submission information for filmmakers, as well as details about the festivals, can be found at filmfreeway.com. Follow the festivals on social media for news about events, discounts, tickets, and more. Also, listen to the Hang On To Your Shorts and Cullen On Film podcasts available via a shared universe network. We've talked a good bit about Clark's return. As far as just the mechanics of it, the use of the mother box and the Genesis chamber, how did you feel about that? I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. My biggest issue with all of that was kind of like, wait a minute, you come up with this idea of rejuvenating Superman and bring him back. It's like, couldn't you have tried to think of this earlier if you felt so guilty about the fact that, you know, he's dead? Uh, but that being said, it's to me, it worked with the plot. I mean, the mother boxes are so powerful. Barry is so fast in terms of generating that energy that, it, you know, it's pseudo science, but you know, it worked. I mean, it certainly didn't look at this like, oh, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. No, I mean, it worked within the con, you know, within the context of this movie. Uh, fine. I didn't really have an issue with it. I agree. I mean, putting aside my whole want for a spiritual component to this <laughs> yeah. in terms of what we got. No, it works because it honors the comics in that the Kryptonian technology is essential to this. It's not just Absolutely. that, oh, they, you know, throw the mother box at him and he's back to life. You need, you need a Kryptonian component. But the mother box, you know, just ties all of this together and also really raises the stakes because once they use this, once they activate it to bring Clark back, Steppenwolf is going to know where it is and he's going to come and get it. Right. So that's Ticking the clock ma- is suddenly put in. Yeah. So that's the major risk. So I think it works well. I also was, uh, I was struck by how long they made us wait to see Clark's face. Did you notice that? I, you know, we see him, of course, at the very in the beginning. water, you mean, or or when he's after he's revived? Like both. You know, when he comes out yeah. of the car, like you don't you don't see any of that. It's just Arthur's taking him out. He puts him in the water, right? And then he's submerged, and then he shoots up into the sky, and we just see him primarily from Lois's vantage point at that distance, and yeah. then he flies down to the remnants of the statue uh, in the park. But even then, like it's it's a while before you actually see his face. I just thought I don't. I don't have any insight per se, but I just thought it was interesting kind of how 
long we had to wait to kind of see him again. But I guess adding to the expect, you know, the suspense, the expectation of like, all right, we're going to see him. We know he's coming. You know, we know he's coming, you know, and then suddenly he lands and and then we get him full force. Uh, I didn't have a problem with that. I mean, I understand what you're saying. It did take a while. And given how limited time he has on screen, maybe we should have got to him a little faster. But that being said, I think it worked. You know what? This is actually one instance, though, where even though, yes, I I did want more of him overall, I was actually okay with that. I just, I thought it was, it was an interesting choice and I I was just struck by it. Um, Again, not harping on the differences between the cuts because- the less said about Justice League, the better. But one of the things that was refreshing to see in this version, and I continue, especially with this viewing, I was really noticing how many more references there are to Superman, which now it's been a while since I watched Justice, Justice League, but I, I don't think you got quite as much of that. Like Barry, when they're digging up the grave, talking about how Superman was his hero. Yeah. Um, that conversation between uh, Bruce and Aquaman, and Aquaman in that scene says, don't bet on it, Batman. So going back to Brian's question, but, oh, yeah. you know, Aquaman's whole thing about strong man is strongest alone. And uh, and then that's when Bruce says, like, Superman, you know, died fighting by my side. So just kind of the memory of Superman uh, is invoked uh, a number of times throughout the movie. And uh, and I like that. And I, that was one of those things that it's like, I remember the first time watching it being like, oh, like they're talking about him more. Right. Well, it's interesting because, you know, with the Justice League version, I remember like I was covering the movie for Geek Magazine and they were so difficult in like acknowledging that Henry Cavill is even going to be in this movie. They just would not, which is why I think they didn't use him in any publicity. They did nothing with him for that, right? So I think the movie as well downplayed Superman uh, tremendously until he does show up and then it becomes a whole thing. In this one, though, I think it all feeds into the fact is, all right, we know he's coming back. But let's build the expectation again. We're all referencing him. We're all acknowledging that we need him, that the world is in danger without him. So that by the time we get him, it's like all to me is all feeding into the expectation of when he does arrive and plays the role that he plays. Yeah. And just the very fact that, I, and by the way, I know we haven't been doing a, you know much in the way of plot summary again. This is one of those instances where. I'm assuming people listening to this are <laughs> familiar enough with the movie, which yeah. uh, is a welcome relief for me as host. You know, I think back to doing all of those Red Skies episodes and I have to lay out, for example, when we're doing uh, death metal, lay out all those cosmic shenanigans and I'm like banging really my great. head against the wall talking about anti-crisis energy. And it's like, please <laughs> make it stop. <laughs> so here I'm assuming people know, but just structurally, right? So much of this movie, you kind of have the dual tracks of Steppenwolf, tracking down these three mother boxes to bring them together to form the unity, which will uh, allow him to take over Earth and essentially turn Earth into an approximation of apocalypse in honor of Darkseid. And he discovers along the way that this is the planet that contains the anti-life equation that Darkseid has sought all these years and that will bring Darkseid to Earth at last. Uh, And hand in hand with that, you have Bruce trying to assemble this team, this alliance of heroes to protect the earth. Because of course, Lex had issued that warning at the end of, of BVS. And then relatively early on into the proceedings in, in Justice League here, Diana gets this whole history lesson when she's uh, alerted by the Amazons. And then she relays all of this to Bruce. And so you have the team coming together while Steppenwolf is retrieving the mother boxes from Themyscira, from Atlantis, uh, and then ultimately from Mankind. And then, of course, all culminating in this final battle in this uh, Russian ghost city that had been decimated by a nuclear blast. So, you know, we don't have to worry about any civilian casualties here in this movie. (laughs) Family in their car. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Thankfully, all of that was uh, nowhere to be found. Um, Nowhere to be found in this. But but even again, just going back to the, the, the jumping off point here, the idea that it's Superman's death, right, that awakens the boxes and, and the one in the mascara in particular that calls to Steppenwolf and, and brings him to earth. Like they were afraid, right? They were afraid because uh, Silas Stone had activated one of the boxes to save Victor. Uh, but that wasn't enough right. to call to, to call to Steppenwolf. It's like now with the Kryptonian gone, now the call can go out because they were afraid. And it's like, once Clark gets back and he gets his memory, <laughs> Steppenwolf is not a physical threat to him like clark makes oh, very short work out of him which so I, I just like that whole idea like they really <laughs> they really needed to come together and get superman and that was it so uh, absolutely you know i gotta say something you know uh, i meant to say this earlier when you talk about the boxes calling out and all that opening moment of the movie 
where Doomsday is killing Superman and he is letting out that scream that is reverberating around the world in these different areas and stuff. That's one of those moments I looked at and said, this is a director who has a vision. And this is a great way to open this movie and set things up, I thought. So I don't know why I didn't say that earlier, but that's, you know. No, I, 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 I like that as well. Just kind of tying the movies together in a very direct way. And yeah. yeah, and showing you how the events of that prior movie, his death in particular, gave rise to what we see here. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm, I was totally on board with that. And speaking of the apocalypse of it all and the mother boxes, I was, like I said, I was so surprised to see how deep we went on all of this and just the the lore of this, right? And this whole backstory that a young dark side had once come to earth and discovered that it was home to anti-life, but all of these armies united for the first time and were able to beat him back and separate the mother boxes before they could form the unity uh, you know, one of the things that has been cited, and I actually struggled with this, I think the first time I watched it, is this whole idea of Darkseid fleeing Earth after that first battle, during the first Age of Man, and then not knowing, not being able to yeah. get back to Earth. <laughs> or not even knowing that that's where the anti-life equation was. I mean, when Stephen Wolf announces it, I mean, I thought that today watching it, I was like, wait a minute, weren't you here already? Don't you know that the anti-life equation is already here? I'll, I'll, I'll give them this. The way I look at it, I think, I, I don't know, maybe we think of, of space travel or interstellar conquest one way, but I think for Darkseid and the armies of Apocalypse, there's, they're operating on a scale, right, that we, we really can't even fathom. Uh, there's one mention at some point of trillions of worlds, like it's just so many worlds and we don't know what their navigation systems are like. I, I so I just kind of chalk it up to like, there's such a volume in terms of their conquest that that feeds into their inability to kind of pinpoint this world among all of the ones that they've conquered. I, that might be a bit of a reach, but I, you know, I, I, I can go along with it. But that was, I think the first time I was like, well, like, why can't he just, why can't he just come back? Like he doesn't know where it is. They have a portal. They could just step through the portal if that's the case. But you know, there's one of the scenes. My, I, I love all the new God stuff. I love boom yeah. tubes, and I love. Uh, the the one there's one moment in particular where you see you're following Steppenwolf coming down the boom tube, and it's just for like a second or two. But it was just right. like just the visual of it was cool. Like this is, I don't know, man. Like it was just amazing to be able to to see all of that. I mean, how did you feel about the visual representation? Of the, you know, the voice, just the presentation of of Darkseid, Desaad, Granny, this, the the Legion of of followers, all that stuff, the Parademons. Look, when you consider that my last uh, version of these apocalypse people and Dark Side as well was on Smallville, and I had issues with their presentation <laughs> of it. Uh, <laughs> you didn't like the you didn't like the cloud, the smoke. No, the smoke I monster? didn't like the clouds oh, right. and all that stuff. Yeah, no. How do you defeat Dark Side? I'll fly right through Lionel. Okay, great. Anyway, that's a total side note. <laughs> um, I have to say, first of all, the Fourth World stuff for something that was considered a relative failure at the time that Kirby created it. That sucker has had some life, whether it's on Superman, the animated series, and now here. And the presentation here to me, I loved it. I thought that the representation of all of those characters was great. But the dark side, and even Stephen Wolf, even though I'm not really that, I wasn't that familiar with Stephen Wolf. But seeing dark side and all that, all his glory uh, and that voice was, was great. And all I remember thinking, watching that for the first time when I saw this was like, I wanted to see Superman and Darkseid like they did on the animated series go, you know, toe to toe with each other and just watch those two battle. I think it would have been amazing. But so I'm very I was very pleased with uh, the presentation, especially knowing that this was a lot of this was being done in post now for this Snyder Cut version. I was very impressed with what they pulled off. So, yeah, it was it was such a blast to see and to just to just get that bigger picture. Right. To know that. Steppenwolf was serving this this master. I mean, as fans of this, we could fill it in when we were watching the theatrical cut, but here to really get to see it. And also this whole business of him being cast out and having to mm-hmm. earn his way back in. That With 10,000 worlds. Yeah, it's like he had been part of some sort of attempted coup seemingly, but then he he slaughtered those who were seeking Darkseid's throne. So he seemed to have some sort of uh, of turnaround, but had committed enough of a betrayal that he's been cast out and he has to prove himself. And that's why when he discovers it's anti-life, it's like that. And I love too the scene where Darkseid materializes, 
uh, in the in the stronghold hold on Earth, yeah. and you see Steppenwolf all of the armor right uh, re retracts right because he's yeah. you know he has to you know sort of subjugate himself before Darkseid. I I don't know. It was just great, and and not that it goes so far as to make Steppenwolf a sympathetic villain. I wouldn't go that far, but it just puts some meat on the bone here. It's like oh, okay, like there's something like this guy has a want beyond just oh conquest. Right? Like there's there's another layer to this here, which I just oh, thought he's was like great. a teenager that's done wrong and is <laughs> desperately trying to redeem himself for this wrong that he did. There's such a desperateness to him. You know, he's so tough with everybody else, but he is. Desperate for Darkseid's approval and forgiveness. Yeah. And what does Darkseid do? He steps on his skull at the end of the movie without even thinking about it, just crushes it. Which is very Darkseid. And you get that yep. stare down uh, between the League and Darkseid and then Darkseid's promise, we will use the old ways. I mean, I was great. As Darkseid was walking off, though, I was saying to myself, that's a long walk. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a really long walk. You might just want to take a boom tube, pal. Right. But uh, no, I mean, all of that was great. It was, it was such a, yeah, it was just such a thrill to get to see all of that as, as a fan yeah. of, of those characters. And to your point, I would say probably from the animated series more than anything else. I mean, if I really go back and I think about what my main exposure to the fourth world characters and concepts, what that exposure was and really what made me a fan. Yeah, it was the animated series. So, you know, to see Make that. Imagine. Action, could you imagine if we got a moment of Superman using that line from Justice League, uh, Ultimate Justice League uh, Unlimited? You know, I live in a world of cardboard, but I can cut loose with you. I mean, to see that in live action, <laughs> been amazing. So, absolutely. We've talked about a, a bunch of the characters so far. There is one, and we talked about the Martha moment from BVS. One of the things that, oh, it breaks my heart about this movie. I think I know where you're going. Is the Martha Manhunter moment. The oh. the reveal that the Martha who has this really heartfelt conversation with Lois and helps her overcome her grief and rejoin the land of the living after an indeterminate period of time. I, how long do you think it's been since Clark died? I'm not sure. I mean, it's been, I mean, obviously it's been quite a while in the sense that it's been months since Lois has gone to work. Um, so it's, I mean, who knows? I mean, it could be a year, maybe. I, I don't even know if that's too much. Well, she's but, pregnant though. So, well, we don't know that though, based we, in this, do we? Well, we, well, we see the pregnancy test. And then at the end, when Clark and Bruce have that moment outside the farm, Bruce is like, congratulations, by the way. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I forgot about that. And that by the uh, just going back to Snyder's plan. So I think people are aware of this. So <sighs> Snyder's original idea, which never even made it past the script stage. Like this was nixed by the studio very early on. But his idea was that Lois and Bruce would have a dalliance at some point and she would get pregnant with his child um, <clears throat> that Bruce would ultimately sacrifice himself and that child would become Batman. The, the kind of, the direction they were heading now was that it would be Lois and Clark's child as set up here. Um, and that in Justice League four or five, right? When they kind of fixed the timeline, uh, this time Bruce would, would save Lois and whether he sacrifices himself then or later in battle, I'm not entirely clear, but Bruce would ultimately give his life in, in the final film. And then Lois and Clark's child in the future would become the next Batman. Like that was the idea, um, which that I'm, I'm all for. I, I, I'm not, I'm not heartbroken that the Lois and Bruce <laughs> romance. Was, no, was next. Please, no. Um, but, uh, but, but in any event here, so I, yeah, I mean, I would say, I don't know. In my head canon, I'm like maybe three months. Like, I don't know that it's been more than that. Maybe, yeah, but maybe. Any, in any event. But yeah. yeah, this this great scene with Martha and Lois and then Martha steps out and we see her shapeshift into Martian Manhunter. Oh, terrible. It, such it, a blunder. It is such a real moment between uh, Lois and Martha. And the fact that Martha is basically talking Lois and it gets through to her because we know she's getting ready to say goodbye to coming up to that monument every day uh, when Clark shows up. It's like, you know, it's like, I just made up my mind not to do this and now you show up again. But the dialogue between them is so heartfelt. And to know that it's Martian Manhunter then, which I'm sure has got to be awkward later when Lois and, and Martha are together. Uh, you really helped me with what you said. What did I say? You know, I mean, it's, uh, uh, so yeah, to me, it was, a, it was a squandered great moment that became, an okay moment, but it just lost its punch. Basically it lost its, uh, resonance to a certain point. So I think, yeah, it had its impact 
on Lois and it, it spurred her to action, which is great, but yeah, it took away a great moment from Martha and yeah. it really, it really bums me out because it doesn't, the only function that it serves is that you get this re because I, I right if memory serves, Martha shapeshifts back into Swanwick for a second before shapeshifting into Martian Manhunter. No, it's Martian Manhunter and then Oh, and then Swanwick. You're right, you're right. Yep, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh so it's like it, you get that reveal that it's Swan, but they could have achieved that in another way. Yeah. Right. You didn't need to do that. And and also I, this kind of speaks to another thing about the Martian Manhunter of it all, where you get that scene. And then of course he shows up in the very final scene of the movie and has this conversation with Bruce about, I've been on the sidelines. I'm going to help. There's a, a threat coming, all, all of that. Uh, my head canon, for sake of the character, um, my head canon is that Martian Manhunter didn't replace Swanwick, who was the general in the first movie and then the secretary of defense in, in BVS didn't replace him until recently because mm. if if swanwick was really jean jones this entire time during the kryptonian invasion during all of the lex shenanigans and the battle with doomsday uh i i don't know i that's kind of a tough pill to swallow even i guess and i get this idea of like he's hiding he's not ready to, to reveal himself but it's like really could have used you pal so i in my head it's like he, this switch happened much later. Well, how do you feel? Well, I think uh, my feeling really, to be honest with you, as much as I'm going on about Snyder has a vision, has a vision, you know, and then I think he gets, that's where he gets self-indulgent. He goes, oh, it'll just be a cool moment to have, you know, Martian Manhunter be this guy, you know? And rather than it feeling real, it felt like what it is tacked on. It just doesn't feel like it was something that was there from the beginning. It was more like, here's a cool moment, kids. Uh, you're going to see Martian Manhunter. And and to me, that, and there's not a lot of that in this movie. That's the thing. But that to me felt like a moment where it was just like, let's do, let's do something cool for the sake of doing something cool. I agree. And we know, I mean, it's funny for as much as it's like, well, he got to do everything he wanted. We know he did want to include uh, John Stewart, Green Lantern, instead of right. Martian Manhunter at the end and filmed footage with an actor named Wayne T. Carr. And there's a photo out there. Uh, and a lot of fan art and, and uh, fan made videos and whatnot of showing what that scene would have been like. Um, but in any event, yeah, I agree. That did feel tacked on and I, I that really bummed me out. Um, but again, as far as the effect that it has on Lois, people, people's mileage on Lois in this movie might vary. Uh, but I, I appreciated what they were going for here because I think this was, uh, I think this was a realistic depiction of someone in grief in mourning. Absolutely. And absolutely. But to the point that, I, 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 what I like about this is that she grabs that press pass. Like she's going back to work that day. She's making one final stop at the monument and then she's going back to work. So she's made that choice and she's come out the other side of it. But the fact that however long it's been that she's still mourning Clark, she's still going through his things. She's still going to this site, this monument to him every day. And that's her routine. And she hasn't gone back to work. Uh, again, I think this just ties into this larger theme of, of, of grief. So even though I think in our heads, we're like, well, Lois, she's tough. Like she'd be back out there. She'd be doing this. She'd be doing that. She's human. She's human. And like we, we keep saying over and over in these episodes, like they're trying to show you these characters as, as people and how they would behave. So I, um, I was totally fine with that. I don't know how you felt. No, I didn't, I didn't have a problem at all. I liked her. In fact, I mean, I'm not one of those people that dislikes her as Lois Lane anyway. I think she's a good Lois Lane. She's not my favorite by any stretch, but I think she's a good, solid Lois Lane. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that thought just went out of my head. <laughs> it happens, but, man, uh, especially yeah. as we pa as we push the two hour mark. And I don't want to keep you here all, all night. Um, if you need to wrap this at any point, you just let me no, know. But speaking of things that some might argue are tacked on, and maybe are tacked on that that final nightmare sequence, which seems designed, and this was something that Snyder shot you know, for, for this, uh, this, this release, uh, not originally, uh, seemed specifically designed to bring together Ben Affleck's Batman and Jared Leto's Joker. Of course, yeah. we also had, uh, Mara and Flash and Cyborg and, and Deathstroke running around. Um, how did you feel about, I guess that nightmare sequence generally, but specifically that, that Batfleck Leto Joker exchange? You know, it kind of goes right back to what I said uh, regarding Superman uh, feeling like we get him back and then we lose him again right away. Bruce has come a huge distance in this movie, as we were saying earlier. So he's he's like come out. He is a hero, man. And in this future thing, and I understand the circumstances of it, 
but it's back to being that like hopeless dark nihilistic and the conversation between them with joker making fun of robin's robin's death and 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 batman talking about harley quinn and basically giving the threat and dropping the f-bomb and all that stuff it just didn't work for me i do not like the epilogue i i will generally once clark you know when i watch this thing except for today when we were doing this talk clark rips open his shirt and it flies into the sky i'm good (laughs) that's usually where i cut the movie i don't buy the epilogue because again it's a step backwards and it's a step backwards for the characters from what we've seen them just go through. So how's that for a quick, uh, summation? Uh, well said. I, I, I don't know where I land on this. Part of me goes back to what I said before about, Hey, even if it is self-indulgent, give him this. Uh, but it's not my favorite aspect of the movie. I think for, for the reasons you cited, it also, we're in the epilogue, right? We're wrapping everything up. And and I know this was, again, I guess serving a, a couple of different functions, in, including potentially teeing up future stories should Snyder have had the chance, or I know some fans still hold on to hope that he will one day have the chance to, to tell yeah. that story. I don't see that <laughs> happening. But, uh, you know, so it, it kind of is, is opening that door and I get it, but I don't know that we needed it at that point. The other thing, so, I mean, here's the thing. The vision that Cyborg has earlier, I think, does the heavy lifting that needs to be done in this movie in terms of the potential dangers ahead. Yes. Right? Absolutely. And that's where you get Lo- uh, Clark holding Lois's body and Darkseid putting the hand on the Like, that gives you what you need. Uh, and then you do have that moment uh, later on where Bruce is talking to Diana and he's like, I had a dream. It was more like a premonition. Right. But Lois is the key. It's something darker. So I think you already have really enough of what you need for this. I really think this was just so that you could have Affleck and Leto together, even though they weren't physically present together on set, they had to be filmed separately because of scheduling, right? which is is funny. But that's one of those things where, I don't know, had the, the entire DCEU ended and you never had a Batman Joker interaction. I mean, I guess you had a, a, a little tiny bit of that in Suicide Squad when he you know, yeah. uh, they go into the water, but that wasn't like a meaningful interaction. Uh, I don't know. It would have been a missed opportunity. And also, I don't know that Jared Leto's Joker based on Suicide Squad is on anyone's list of <clears throat> all time great Joker performances. I know he has his fans, but it's <laughs> generally, I don't think that would be the case here. At least I, I definitely enjoyed this presentation of his Joker more than mm. I did the Suicide Squad version. So I feel it's like, all right, at least it helps to kind of redeem that a little bit it gets the the two characters in a scene together um i'm okay like again going back to what i was saying before this doesn't ruin the movie for me it's it's i could have done without it and that's probably that and the martha manhunter are probably the two things like i really could have done without but right uh but it doesn't ruin it for me and to be perfectly honest i have less of an objection to it than i do the martha bit like that i like that genuinely bothers me This podcast is an affiliate of BCW Supplies. The next time you need to restock on comic book bags, boards, boxes, and more, be sure to use promo code FSP to save 10% on your order. That's FSP for Flat Squirrel Productions. It helps support the show too. Many of you have already used this code and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. This podcast is made possible by the support of our Patreon community. Sign up for a monthly or annual membership at patreon.com slash Anthony Desiato and choose from a range of rewards. This week, I want to spotlight our President Luther's cabinet tier. Get every episode of the podcast at least a day early and commercial free. Sign up today and thank you to all patrons. You know, we were talking about Lois Lane before just a short while ago. And I remember when I interviewed the director of the Injustice animated film, and we talk about the ending of that where evil... uh, Superman was lost Lois and his unborn baby and freaks out and takes over the planet, basically. The thing that snaps him out of it is taking Lois, a pregnant Lois, from another Earth and bringing her to him. And he stops and he steps down at that point. And I remember he said to me, people say that Superman is the most powerful person in the DC universe. It's Lois Lane. And in this movie, where he's about to kill Batman, it's Lois Lane that snaps him out of whatever stage he's in with his mind, it clears the clouds and he suddenly recognizes her. And that says a lot about the connection. And again, the power of Lois Lane as a character. And I think that was conveyed very well in this movie. So 
totally. Because when you think about it, you have Diana calling him Kalel, and that mm-hmm. doesn't register. She uses the lasso on him. There's like a little moment there, Flat. a little flicker, but still not enough. You have Bruce calling him Clark. So he hears right. Clark, but this isn't, this isn't a Martha-esque moment. It's not enough for Bruce to say Clark. He needs Lois calling him Clark and coming to him. And, you know, going back to what I was saying before, yeah, I wish that unlike BVS where I was okay with the lack of vocalization from, from Clark, I did want a little more in this movie, but I think it speaks to the strength of Lois mm. and that dynamic that it still works because she shows up and it's like, oh, okay. Like you see how she gets through to him. And gets him back home. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, you know, not a lot of Lois in this, but uh, I think what we did get was, you know, was certainly effective. Absolutely. And and few one of the few people you get a private life moments with, in a sense, like with Clark and Lois on the farm. Yes, you have some with uh, some like Barry and his dad and stuff, but there's not a lot of that sort of human interaction rather than superhuman interaction. So I thought that was interesting. That's the thing. When you look at these movies, the, the first two were so grounded. I mean, Man of Steel, very sci-fi, but we're dealing with Kryptonians and they're humanoid. And so there's that connection point. And then it's really not until Doomsday at the end of BVS where it's like, whoa, like we're really in CGI territory and we're over the top. You're like, right. there's so, and this, this movie, it just like explodes with Themyscira, with Atlantis, with Apocalypse, we're, we're, we're all over the place. And, you know, you see the world expand. Again, I think you do, you, you do lose that groundedness and kind of that real world thread and theme that we were talking about. But again, fair to say we've moved past that point and we're in this We've had two movies of it and now we're into basically superhero territory. But when we do get those moments of Lois yeah. in the apartment and Martha, quote unquote, Martha and Lois in the apartment yeah. and, and them on the farm... It, it goes such a long way. And look, yeah. I know I'm a broken record on this, but but as a dad, and I obviously you are as well, and you watch this with your son, the any of the father-son moments in this movie, Barry and his dad at the prison, uh, Victor and his father fraught, though that relationship was, uh, Clark walking through the ship and hearing hearing the voices of his fathers, uh, all of that you know really, really gets to me, especially, and we've cited this line many times before, but when Jor-El says to Clark, before Clark, clad in his black suit, takes flight and recharges, says, your heart was tested, but you gave hope to their world. That's that To me, that's the line. I, I feel like for people yeah. who really have had a hard time with this presentation of Superman, this context, the setting in which we've, we've been told the Superman story, I feel like that's the line. Like His heart was tested in these movies in a way that you typically don't see. But Absolutely. He still gave hope to the world through his actions, through his deeds, through the miracles he performed, and ultimately through the death, the life that he sacrificed for them. Uh, and even that, as always, wasn't enough to stop him. So his heart was tested, but he gave hope to the world. I love that line. That's one of my favorite lines from, I think, this entire trilogy. Absolutely. The stuff, you know, it's so funny. It's like over the years, like there's a great music video. I don't know if you've seen it or not, to, Re- to Remy Zero's uh, Save Me. And it's, but it's different Superman. It's Clark from Smallville. It's it's Henry. It's Christopher Reeve, whatever. And the moments between Clark and Jonathan that come in and out of this thing, no matter who's doing it, no matter whether it's John Schneider or or uh, Kevin Costner, whoever it is, it plays beautifully. Those moments between father and son, it just has such power to it. And you hear that dialogue, whichever ones it is, and you, again, you take away this is why Clark is the man that he is. From the guidance of these men, these these well, the man Jonathan, but the different versions of it, you believe that every one of them pretty much has given Clark what he needed to become the man he is. So, anyway, I've not seen yes. that video. I'll need to look it up. I've certainly you heard that song, really the Smallville theme song. Uh, yeah. I don't know a thousand times, thousands of times. I don't even know if yeah. over all these years, but. Uh, Let's, uh, we have a couple more questions that I think we can, we can yeah. probably get through these relatively quickly and, and hit on yeah, anything no else that we want to here. So yeah. this is from uh, one of our patrons, Jan, who says the three movies each had a different director of photography. Which of the three films do you think is the best visually? And Jan says, I say uh, BVS is my answer. Larry Fong is, is one of the goats. Do you, visually, when you look at the three of them, do you, do you have a favorite? I mean, maybe it's cause I just saw it, but there is so much in the photography of, of, uh, Snyder cut of Justice League that just works beautifully to me, even though lots of it's CG and that kind of thing, but it all blends together. It just creates, again, it's creating a world. And it really, 
like the first two movies felt like real world for most of it, basically to me, this one just brings us into the, uh, the comic book realm, but still rooted in reality. And so that's where you can go to Atlantis and, and, and to the Island and to wherever it is. And it just all just has a great look to it. I think it just, none of it feels fake, even though we know that so much of it is, is green screen. Uh, but just, I don't know. It just may, again, maybe it's cause I saw it today, but I really am impressed with this, the look of this one. Gotcha. I, it's definitely the most <clears throat> Snydery of, of the three. It definitely yeah. feels most in line with his vision. I, I, I love all three of them. I think I have to go with Jan though, is having just rewatched all three, something about BVS. I just, I really, I really dug the mm. the look of that. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with that. Jan also asks, uh, and this to me, this feel Jan, this feels like a hot take. He says, my favorite character in the whole Snyder verse is Perry white as played by Lawrence Fishburne. Where would he rank for you? Uh, I love Lawrence Fishburne as Perry white. It, it, his characterization though, kind of, kind of bugged me a little bit. At points, mm. just that overly skeptical, uh, you know, kind of gruff version of the character, especially when Clark is trying to investigate and Perry, for some reason, is just wanting him to cover sports. I, you know, yeah, that I never really that tracked, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Um, but yet he was aware enough in Man of Steel to say, good, I'm glad you're dropping this, Lois. Can you imagine if you expose this, if we expose this to the world that this exists? And to me, I like that aspect of the guy that like news, 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 but not this news for the reason that he's citing. I thought that was kind of cool, but I agree with you. And also is like, you know, fly coach, you know, whatever. I mean, it became a little cartoony, I guess, in some ways, but yeah, but that stuff worked for me in Man of Steel. Yeah. Like I love the actor as the character and I, there are yeah. moments that I like. And I think had we spent more time and gotten to know this version of the character, he would probably rank h- higher. But yeah, there were instances where I'm like, yeah. And then we have one final question from Jan who says, this is interesting. He says, I know Jeff Johns' involvement in Justice League is very controversial and we don't need to get into the Ray Fisher of it all, thanks. Uh, But I do think his contributions to uh, the Snyder Cut are criminally underrated. I think that movie works because it fuses Snyder's visual sensibilities, his biggest asset, with the more character-driven approach of Johns. It honestly feels like the best of both worlds. It has the gorgeous Snyder visuals without some of his weaker storytelling tics. Cyborg's relationship with Silas and Barry's relationship with Henry both have Johns' DNA all over them. What do you think? Do you see the Jeff Johns DNA there too, or am I crazy? I don't really, I didn't sense Jeff Johns at all, to tell you the truth. I think Chris Terrio and the others just did a good job capturing these characters. I mean, you know, uh, the thing I go to with Jeff Johns is that, from my understanding, is that if you look at the Green Lantern movie, he's the one who argued with the ta- for the tag of Sinestro at the end even though Sinestro just praised Hal Jordan for, for what he was able to bring to the table and suddenly he's putting on the yellow ring and becoming it just like gratuitous comic book stuff saying, Oh, this worked in the comic. Let's do this in the movies. I didn't get a sense of that in this movie. So I don't really give Jeff Johns credit. Maybe that's not fair of me, but I don't really give him the credit for this. I give him, I'll, I'll walk the line here. I'll give him a little more credit than you did, but not as much as Jan did. So this is okay, fair enough. I think, I think this, you know, these movies do work with the the modern templates for a lot of these characters that Johns established. Fair. Probably okay. most notably when he brought Barry back. I mean, technically Grant Morrison brought Barry back in Final Crisis, but it was it was Jeff Johns in uh, Flash Rebirth that really reestablished him and the mythos and the supporting cast and injected this new element that his mother had been murdered. And that's now been this driving theme for the character for better or worse. Fair enough. So I think that's, for example, one key example of the Jeff Johns influence. Also credit where credit's due. I had not read the secret origin arc of Justice League from the new 52 that Jeff Johns wrote until relatively recently, to be perfectly honest. There it's dark side as the main antagonist that brings the team together. So there's that. (laughs) But, But also I think it's in that arc, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, Diana entering man's world tries ice cream and says, Oh, this is delicious. You must be very proud. Right. And I had not read that when I first watched the wonder Woman. and you watch that wonder woman movie. And it's such a funny, charming moment. It's like, Oh, that's great. And it's like, that came straight out of a Jeff Johns comic. So, so I don't know what I'm talking about is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I, I, I think that there's a, there's an influence there. I, I look at it more in terms of the templates for these characters that he established. 
Oh, let me also say this whole theme theme of of grief and again the lost parents primarily, but also lost loves in, in various forms. I do think that is a unifying theme for these characters, and I think it's a, mm. a, a resonant part of this movie. At the same time, I don't. It's not that I would always need to see the characters presented this way and kind of driven by that. I think it works in this instance. And that kind of something that I wanted to circle back to when we talk about Man of Steel, because I remember someone on social media after I did my Man of Steel episode said, um, essentially, like, I don't feel Jonathan Kent needs to die for Clark's origin story. And I wrote back and I was like, yeah, man, like generally I don't either. I mean, I was raised on the Triangle Era comics and Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Like my sweet spot is Jonathan and Martha being alive. I'm not saying this is the only way you can ever tell the story. And I think that's an important piece to this. It's just that I understand and respect and appreciate what function it's serving here in this story. It's not like, oh, it always has to be this way every single yeah. time you do this. Similarly with the with the grief kind of angle here. But I think for, for me, it works. A couple of quick uh, minor things here. Uh, Mara's British in the Snyderverse. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing how that, that weaves in and out of the thing? Uh, yeah, that is pretty funny. But again, uh, who knows? I guess he did. that was his vision for the character, and he just went with it. But I, I yeah. like he stuck with it for that that added yeah. on nightmare sequence, right? Yeah. Obviously, the original footage that we saw earlier in the movie that was already shot with with that accent, but it stuck with it. So I don't know, it's just the, the kind of amusing. Yeah. This this is so minor, but maybe this is because I work, I am a higher ed administrator at a law school, but <clears throat> when Victor's mom was chewing out the uh, the, the dean or, or whatnot of, of Gotham University because Victor had hacked into the grading system and changed yeah. the classmates' grades and the mother's like, well, her family lost her house. How do you expect her to pass her classes? What did you do to help her? It's like, ma'am, with all due respect, it's not the school's responsibility. And also the answer isn't to change your grades. Right, exactly. There was no, that's just a, that's just a moment that just has no reality to it, basically. Very minor, you know? but I was just, that, that definitely yeah. struck me as I was watching it. I'm like, all right, but, uh, well, that's, I think that's, not that we're here to compare the cuts, but I, I there's, there's so much that's different, but I feel like Victor's story Oh my God, it's night and day. Right. Uh, between what we see in this movie compared to what we got in Justice League is just incredible. And so much of the movie centers around Victor's journey and what he goes through and the tie in with the mother box. And it's because of that. And I don't even remember if that part of it was in Justice League, but there's just so much more of Victor. And Ray Fisher is fantastic in this movie. He really delivers a great performance and his arc. Like at the end of Justice League, where he says, uh, you know, Superman says, I'm happy, you know, I want to, I'm happy to be alive again. And he goes, me too. Or I want to live. Yeah, me too. I can't remember the exact lines, but it just felt like a corny comic book moment. In this movie, though, by the time Victor gets to the end of the movie, where he says to his parents in the, within the mother box thing, within that reality, that I'm not broken and I'm not alone. I mean, that is a tremendous journey for that character. To have gone through from feeling like a Frankenstein monster at the beginning of the thing to this thing where he's got a family now. It's kind of what I was saying before, right? We've all dealt with our loss and now we're coming together. You know, we're healing basically with each other. And I think his is the is the greatest version of that through that movie. I agree. He really becomes the heart of this. I gotta ask, because we haven't talked about him yet, other than a brief mention earlier, Lex. Yeah. So we see Lex again very briefly building off of what we had seen at the end of BVS where he's in the scout ship and he's communing with Steppenwolf and uh, he's there when the Superman's death whale goes out. Uh, and then we know from BVS he ends up getting locked up, his head shaved, sent to Arkham. Uh, he's raving about the bell's been rung and they, they know when they're coming and all of that. And he seems pretty unhinged. Uh, at, at that point, uh, at the very end of BVS. And then yeah. we don't see him in, until just about the very end of, of Justice League and he's on his yacht and he's still bald, but he's uh, in his in his fancy suit. He's broken out of Arkham and we have this exchange with uh, Joe Manganiello's Deathstroke right. where Lex reveals to Deathstroke that Bruce Wayne is Batman, setting up what would have been the Batfleck movie. Just curious, what was your take on that scene, that exchange, and just kind of what we see of Lex, the little bit we see of him? Unfortunately, it feels because we don't see Lex, like we don't even see Lex in the future, you know, in the in the nightmare sequence, 
to me, it felt like what it was. It was just a very tacked on scene that unfortunately doesn't go anywhere. Uh, I like Jesse Eisenberg's Lex in Batman v, you know, Batman v Superman. It's wacky. It's different. And I think that's why I liked it so much. And he really was a guy using his brains, his brilliance, even though he's insane, to get what he wants uh, and to manipulate these two heroes into battling each other. But in this scene, it's like, it's all right. It's like, ooh, we told him he's Batman. Okay, but we know it doesn't go anywhere, so it doesn't really mean anything. And that's sort of my problem with it. And weirdly, when I looked at Lex, bald, I thought of John Cryer on Supergirl for some reason. I don't know why. He kind of reminded me of that Lex uh, for some reason. But the scene itself is just, like I say, it just doesn't go anywhere. I mean, I don't know. It's okay, but not the dramatic moment it's intended to be. Yes. Knowing that we're never going to see that Batfleck deathstroke confrontation, it's it's a bummer. If it's a not it, not that it feels like a non-starter. It is a non-starter. I think though, not to overthink this or nitpick it, but I, I do think one of the other things that I kind of kind of have a little bit of an issue with is and I talked at length in the BVS episode about how I really came around on this version of Lex and what he was about and what he was trying mm. to show to the people and what a God is and isn't and all of that business. And it was very high minded and philosophical kind of his motivation and his means too. I mean, obviously it got very practical in terms of the specific machinations and puppeteering that he was engaged in, but right. the, but again, it, it all kind of felt a lot grander, I suppose. And this is so specific. Like he's like Bruce Wayne is Batman. <laughs> like, like Lex yeah. had that information in the last movie. He knew that Clark Joe was Superman and he knew that oh, yeah. Bruce was Batman and he used that information, but it was never about, Oh, I'm going to reveal your secret. And so here, right. and look in, in fairness, he's gone through a, a transformation physically and, 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 and whatnot <laughs> and, uh, and, and mentally and emotionally, whatever journey he's had after being on the ship, being in Arkham. And so maybe his tactics have changed and that's fair. Yeah. And that's fair, but it just, it, it did feel a little bit, a little bit divorced. The other thing too, you said, you know, he's insane. So this is something I've seen, people, and I guess I've engaged in this as well, kind of going back and forth on social media about this version of Lex, like how crazy is he? And when is he crazy? I mean, do you think he's just like insane throughout the proceedings of everything we've seen? Or do you think there are kind of moments? I think it's more manic moments that we get from him. I mean, look, the guy is brilliant. I mean, it's, it's obvious, but he's, he's unhinged. I mean, he's got daddy issues. He's got uh, you know, you certainly get that he was abused by his father uh, in Batman versus Superman, you know. Um, but, you know, you get those great moments like <laughs> like when when in BVS, when when he's talking to Superman at the end where Superman says she's going to be fine or something. He goes, I cannot lose to you. And then Superman looks, he goes, you'll get used to it. He goes, hm, I'll get used to it. <laughs> you know, and he goes on from there. I love that moment. Um but, and that's the thing. It's like, I think he's nuts, but he's a dangerous, he's not like the Joker Looney Tunes. You know, the joke is insane. I don't see Lex and the, even this version of Lex being insane. I think he's brilliant, but I think he is unhinged. And I think he was so damaged growing up that that has sort of perverted his view of the universe, basically. I, I agree. I don't think he's Joker-like insane throughout. No. I, I do think that the experience on the ship and particularly that exchange with Steppenwolf, whatever was transferred between the two of them. I, I do think that accounts for the kind of over the top demeanor at the end of BVS when Bruce goes into his prison cell. Yeah. I think that accounts for it. He has a line, although it, at the same time, it's like, well, is he really crazy at the end of BVS? He's right. Like dark side is coming. <laughs> so it's, yeah, but he comes across really nuts. Like his mind has yes. been unhinged by what's been fed into it. Basically. So then he has a line on the yacht in Justice League about the dark the doctors at Arkham helping him, something to that effect. Mm. And at first I always kind of read that as like just being sarcastic. But then I'm like, I don't know. Did, <laughs> like, cause he seems far more composed. I mean, it could just be he's calmed down. Yeah. Uh, right. Or maybe there maybe there was I mean, I don't know. It's uh I haven't read that much into the scene. I was more <laughs> like, eh. <laughs> I think that's as much as I read into it. So uh I know. Yeah. I've been thinking about these these three, these three movies a lot for these past few weeks, but man, it's yeah. it's been so much fun. You know, we're we're well past the two hour mark here. It, w is there anything about this movie we have not talked about that you want to talk about? 
I mean, look, I mean, given that this is the end of the Snyderverse, uh, and I think I touched on this before anyway, he did a brilliant job of casting these characters. Uh, I think Ben Affleck is probably my favorite Batman. I think he, I wanted to see his solo Batman movie. I wish we were getting more of him doing so. Um, Henry Cavill, who I still think got the short end of the stick with a lot of this stuff. Uh, I do, but the way I look at it is this. But Christopher Reeve, for instance, you can love Superman 1 and 2. Superman 3 and 4, not so great. But if you want to see Christopher Reeve as Superman, you watch Superman 1, 2, 3, and 4, usually in a marathon type thing. Henry Cavill got three good movies out of this, one crappy movie out of this, but he has a couple of good moments in it, and a nice cameo. That's not a bad Superman legacy to have, as far as I'm concerned. If that's all you're going to get... That's better than Brandon Routh only getting one movie with Superman Returns, right? So I think, and with with Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, all of them, I think these actors were so perfectly matched for these characters that I'm very sorry that we won't be seeing them in the future. But we've got these three movies, and that's pretty good. This is not a bad uh, legacy uh, to have with these characters bringing these characters to life so now we move on to the next chapter well said and while yes i do see some some disconnects between the first two movies and the third one if we're looking at this as a as a complete trilogy yeah. uh, they do work uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about and particularly if you're tracking superman's arc from deciding and ultimately revealing himself to the world dealing with the world's reaction to him ultimately inspiring the world and then coming back and coming back in a way where he feels more self-assured. We don't get to see much of it, but of what we do see, right. it does feel like this is a Superman who has accepted his role and has been accepted. And so even knowing, okay, this, these were the, the threads that were being set up and this was what maybe was going to come. And he yeah, is still in the black suit at the end of this movie, but you can look at, at his arc in particular across these three movies. And I do feel it feels satisfying as satisfying as it can knowing all of the behind the scenes yeah shenanigans that went on and amazing that we got the movies we got considering all of that it really is because you realize how much interference i said this earlier but how much interference went into these things if they just left them alone and let the movies come out and see what even if people were polarized about it guess what they made a lot of money just let him do his thing and and maybe who knows what it, where this thing could have gone but let him cook you also wonder mm -hmm. they gutted a half hour from bvs which was a lot and makes a difference and it made when you, but huge was that worth it to them like to get that half like this mandate oh it couldn't be more than but two and a half hours i mean i could see if there oh, it has to be two hours i mean it would be even worse if you had to gut that much but it's like all right you're losing an hour. You can, you can have more show times in a day, whatever the case may be, but it's like, yeah, who cares? Like what they sacrificed for just a half hour. I, I, they shot themselves in the foot. Absolutely. And like, we know that, you know, studio interference in, insisted on Aries and wonder woman battling at the end of woman, wonder woman. And what is the weakest part of that movie? That battle between Wonder woman and Aries. Yep. I mean, it just makes no sense. The Suicide Squad, now we'll never see probably David Ayer's Suicide Squad, but that's another one where supposedly interference, just let these things come out and, you know what I mean, in the vision of the directors and let them rise or fall. And even with everything, like I said, if you add up how much money they spent and how much money these movies made, they're very much in the clear, you know? I mean, it's like... And yet they act like, because we didn't do Marvel money the first time out, we have to change everything. It's very frustrating as a fan looking at this stuff. So I know. They should have let Snyder cook. You mentioned mm -hmm. interviewing him. I, I'm sure you know you can't give anything away, but I guess what was, I don't know, what was he like in that conversation? Is, is there anything else? Very that enthusiastic, despite everything. I mean, he's very enthusiastic, definitely believed in his vision. Uh, I, mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned the Henry Cavill uh uh, tag in in Black Adam, and he goes, he goes. Why they play the John Williams theme? Why don't you just put him in the red underwear for God's sakes? If you're just going to go backwards like that, so he wasn't too happy about that. Uh, but he talked. He talked about the interferences. Like I said, with the director's cut of uh, 
BVS, Warner Brothers didn't even care that he was doing it. They just were indulging him, basically, because they weren't going to have to spend any money on it, putting it back together, uh, the pieces. And yet, he, according to him, I think he said that it made something like, through sales, I think it made like 400 million bucks or something, or like tremendous amount of money uh, for this extra footage. And, you know, we talked about casting Henry, and then when Henry, I mean, these a lot of these stories you've heard already, uh, him putting on Christopher Reeve's costume, and, you know, you look at the costume just laying there, and it looks like a joke, and then suddenly Henry came out in it, and it was like, oh my God, he's Superman. You know, things like that. So the man was, the man is still so enthusiastic about what he was able to do, frustrated by what he wasn't able to do. Um, and I did ask him, look, you know, people say about Netflix getting the rights, and you're doing it, and he's like, look, I don't think so. I don't think something like that could happen. He goes, but you know what? Whoever thought that this cut of Justice League could have happened. So you just never know. But he certainly didn't seem like it was a likely thing. Um, But his enthusiasm, that was the big thing I took away. Still, despite everything that went down, I think he loved the opportunity he had to do. And he certainly loved making a film of Superman. He was very excited about that still. so. And that's great that he could still have that outlook after all of this. And, yeah. you know, kind of on that note, yes, I, I remain kind of dumbfounded that we even got Zack Snyder's Justice League after the yep. time that passed, after everything. And, and again, like we said at the top, I think it was all those forces coming together. But Perfect you know, storm. while we weren't here to talk about the fan movement, I, I do want to say that I, if not for that, we definitely wouldn't have, have seen this. And yeah. while... Yes, in, in any fandom, including this one, there there can be toxicity. And you see the toxicity in terms of those who will kind of only accept Snyder's vision. You do also see it on the other side as well, to the point where, you know, I've, I've you know, even for myself, like whether it's posting or doing these episodes and talking about why I love these movies, it's like, you know, I'm not a quote unquote uh, Snyder bro or cultist or any of the other labels. I just, right. I enjoy these movies. I understand that not everybody does. I respect the positions and there are, I, you know, I, I, I would take, you know, you in that category as well. It's like, there are a lot of us. And so I feel like, uh, again, just when we talk about this fan movement, there was a lot of money that was raised uh, for suicide prevention. Yes. There was a lot so. of enthusiasm mm-hmm. that was demonstrated to this studio that, that gave, gave rise to this. Yes, there is toxicity, and I, you know, I, I am never for that. I would never want to participate in that. I don't think that's healthy or productive. Um, right. But again, we don't want to paint with the broad brush. So for those fans who really were, you know, positive and helped bring this about, and you know, I, I, I tweeted the release the Snyder Cut hashtag, you know, proudly, and I'm, I'm right. very happy that we ended up with this. So. <clears throat> Uh, you know, I, I kind of just wanted to to say that, but, uh, yeah. yeah. And it's like I said earlier, you go with the things you love. James Bond for me is another one. I mentioned Star Trek and Dark Shadows and Planet of the Apes. James Bond's another one. It's like, I could have stopped after Sean Connery, but I didn't because I enjoy the character. I just want to see where it goes next. I wish more people were like that. And so not locked into what their vision of a character or a premise is, you know, a show is, uh, but anyway, that probably won't change. <laughs> it's it, it can be difficult to navigate, but I so enjoyed uh, this conversation. I'd really yeah, thank you too. so much for for taking part in this. I'm glad we could have you on for this. Absolutely, I was thrilled to be here. So it's, it's great fun talking about this stuff. So thank you. Good, good. Uh, no, I really enjoy this a lot. I thank you once again. I thank Bernie who joined me for Man of Steel. I thank Justin DeVoe who joined me for Batman v Superman. Talking with you three guys with the passion and the uh you know the depth that we did really was very fulfilling and cathartic for me and i i more so than ever before as much as we've talked about these movies i feel like i put it all out there like i've i've said what i wanted to say about these movies and these episodes are there and they'll live out there and I appreciate everyone who has been tuning in, whether you agree or not. I appreciate you sharing your takes and being cool about it. And once again, I'm grateful for these movies. I'm a fan. And uh, for those who kind of share that, awesome. For those who don't, that's cool too. And once again, I'll just say for anyone who is inspired in any way, shape or form to rewatch one or more of these movies, please do, please share the results. And I hope you get something out of it because that's the thing at the end of the day that I cannot deny is that these movies were meaningful, are 
are and remain meaningful to me and elicited uh, an emotional reaction that I can't deny and that I very much appreciate. So flaws and all, whatever it might be, there's something here. Uh, and so I'm glad that we were able to talk about it the way we did. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, audience. Make sure you come back next week for another all new episode. And until then, as always, it's about what you do. It's about action. Be sure to check out our sister podcast series, another exciting episode in the adventures of Superman, an episode by episode breakdown of the classic George Reeves television show available wherever you get podcasts. Please join us on social media, become a patron and subscribe, rate and review today. Links are in the show notes. Thank you all.